That's so funny. Okay, you're lying. You're lying. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone's enjoying Dragon Quest RTA Marathon 2023. My name's Sum Diener, and coming up, we've got Dragon Quest 3 Super Famicom version. I'm joined here by a friend of mine. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Lafkian. Um, I have quite a bit of experience running this game, and I am very excited to help you guys understand what's going on, because, uh, Diener, there is something kind of funny about this uh, screen that we're sitting on. It's kind of hard to read. Uh, yeah, um, this game, Dragon Quest III, this version uh, on the, the Super Nintendo version, is a Japanese-only release, and it's extremely popular to play in Japan. Very competitive, very very storied uh, uh, speedrunning history with it, right? So um, uh, we kind of play by the Japanese community rules. So uh, if you can't read the text, that's fine. Uh, we'll do our best to explain the meat and bones of what's going on in the run. Um, but one thing I would like to explain about the run up front is that it's pretty heavily influenced by RNG, and the run can get pretty wild at times too. So I'll be pro probably doing most of the focusing on playing the game, and uh, that's why I've got some some help here on uh, trying to explain it and keep me focused on on topic, right? So, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think oh, sorry, I'm all, go ahead. No, I think I'm all set. So. Um, if you are all ready to, um, uh, I think I'm uh, ready to start the run. So um, yeah, let's get, let's get it going. All right. So then I'm gonna count it down from three from power on here. Everyone ready? Let's go. Three, two, one, go. Alrighty, so one thing I just want to get out of the way real quick. Again, uh, this run is entirely going to be in Japanese. Uh, Some Diener and I uh, can both read enough Japanese to know what's going on here. Uh, if anyone in the audience, uh, in chat or whatever, uh, needs clarification on what's going on, feel free to ask. Um, we know quite a bit about this game. Um, anyone who's played the Game Boy Color version of Dragon Quest III uh, should recognize uh, this screen here. Um, this is where I want to say it's the spirit of Rubis. I'm not sure if it's ever actually identified who's talking to you, but um, there is a personality uh, quiz for the hero that kicks the game off. And uh, depending on the first question that is asked, the first question is random, um, but uh, there is a series of forced answers that we can give to force this particular uh, final question. Uh, you have an option of pushing this boulder back to the old man or not, and by not pushing the boulder back to the old man, we guarantee the lazy personality for our hero. And personality plays a huge role in the stats that a character is going to uh, gain over the course of the run. Um, this particular uh, personality for the hero gives a slight boost to attack power and a large boost to HP. Uh, and HP is going to be really the thing that we're looking uh, for the most uh, over the course of this run. So, mm -hmm. And that's going to be true for all of our characters. Stamina, which means more HP, is always the most important thing. All right, Lazy Hero Life. There are a couple of different hero personalities, but Lazy Hero is the most popular for this run. So it's the hero's 16th birthday to start the run, uh, and we're going to get basically the bulk of our exposition for like the next two hours. Uh, basically, the hero's father, Ortega, was a hero who tried to fight the demon lord, Baramos, but uh, went missing and was never seen or heard from again. So now that we're 16, we're old enough to follow in his footsteps, go on a quest to fight the demon lord, Baramos. So yeah, that's going to be our main objective here, is to find and defeat the evil that is Baramos. The king's going to give us 50 gold and some basic starter equipment to uh, begin the game. Kind of stingy if you ask me. And uh, we're going to pick up some starting stuff just to sell for money later while I get ready to recruit my characters. Yeah, I've always found it amusing that, uh, especially if you know how brutal the Baramos fight is, uh, the fact that the king basically gives you a pile of kindling and some pocket change uh, and just kind of sends you on your way. It is um, uh, one interesting... Uh, kind of work around to uh, what I'm sure we all did as kids, uh, where you just uh, quote unquote recruited a whole bunch of soldiers to sell their clubs for a ton of money. They decided they didn't want to let you do that anymore. All right. Um, oh, yeah, Dino, do you want to go ahead and explain this? Uh, no, I was just going to say we're going to recruit four characters here, and 
three of them in particular. I'm looking for lots of stamina and specific personality types. So, uh, might take a couple of tries here to get the characters I want, but uh, you want to explain a little bit about what each of them is kind of their main role is going to be here. Absolutely. So the first thing we're doing here, the first character that Diener made was the uh, merchant. Uh, the merchant is something that's required to beat the game, but we're going to let the merchant chill here for a while while we roll the characters that are actually going to be doing the combat. We're going to be starting with a uh, female wizard uh, here, which if you want to call it that. And here specifically, we're uh, pumping uh, stamina into this character to try to get uh, specific uh, personality traits. So just like with the hero, uh, we wanted the specific personality type. And for each of our characters that we recruit here, we also want a specific personality type. And so we're trying to, we're looking for certain breakpoints with the stamina stats. Uh, and then we do need, uh, there's still like a 50-50 chance of getting certain things. Yeah, tough guy uh, is exactly, if we can get tough guy on all three of our characters, that's perfect. Um, tough guy imparts a massive amount of HP growth uh, over the course of the run. Um, there are some other personalities uh, that you can settle for uh, if you want, um, but ideally you get tough guy on all of them. Um, the one exception uh, is the soldier, which we are rolling for now. Um, you absolutely must get tough guy on the soldier. As long as your stamina is 19 or higher. Yep, we, there it is. There's the, the minimum 19 tough, tough guy. guy. I'll take it. You got tough the is tough. Uh, the, the reason why the soldier in particular needs tough guy uh, is honestly pretty much for the final fight of the game. Um, you There is no safe amount of HP that the warrior can have uh, for fighting Soma. Um, so we want tough guy, like we have to have it uh, in order to uh, make that fight as safe as possible. Yeah, that whole end stretch, really. All right, we're distributing a little bit of that starter equipment there, the uh, club and the traveler's close to the warrior, the uh, mighty stick, plus two attack power to the thief. We're going to head out on our quest. It's really important that as we progress forward here towards the town of Reeve and on our early objective, the thief key, that we work towards earning some experience points. Uh, 15 points will level up the warrior, thief, and mage to level two. Yeah, and uh, when we do get to level two, um, one thing you're going to notice is we are going to get a ton of HP on all but the hero. Uh, so the, the warrior, the thief, and the witch that we picked up, uh, they are all going to get a ton of HP, which is again a byproduct of pumping up their stamina. It's actually kind of fortunate that it just works out that uh, the personalities that we want for these characters also require us to pump up their stamina. And so what's going to happen is when these characters reach level two, the game is going to take a look at their stamina and their HP, and they're going to say, wow, your stamina is really high and your HP is really low. Let's fix that. And it fixes that by giving you somewhere between 25 and 30 hit points. Um, so yeah, you're going to see these hit point values skyrocket momentarily. Pretty dangerous fight for this level. Yeah, this is, look, this is actually no joke right here. It's not a huge deal if somebody dies. The mage in the back uh, does have uh, kind of low hit points. Um, but uh, obviously we want everybody to get experience uh, if at all possible. But yeah, this is actually... Honestly, you usually don't see two fights uh, walking from uh, the, the Aliahan to Reeve. Hey, um, good news. But there's the level two, so... Yeah, there's level two for everybody, so yeah. Took a lot of damage, but we earned a lot of gold in XP, which is not to be not to be underestimated on how useful that is early. Okay, we're gonna sell some of the items we acquired earlier on for some starter cash. We're gonna actually buy some supplies. If you look carefully, um, you'll notice oops, no, not the turban. Ah, sorry. I'm a little excited today. Um, uh, no one in my party can knows any healing magic, so we're really going to rely on these items. Yakuso. These are medical herbs to heal our party for big stretches of the game. We're also going to buy these Wings of the Wyvern. Camera Wings. These are going to help us get around the, uh, the world really quickly uh, by traveling to different towns that we've already visited. Alright, good. Hold up. Don't forget to heal the hero, too. He took a 
quite the bashing as well. And we're off to our next destination to get our first key item that's... it's a key. It's the Thief's Key. Yep, we need the Thief's Key in order to uh, progress the plot. And uh, while we... so we're gonna um, head down this well and then make our way up to the top of the tower. And on the way up, uh, we are gonna be fighting things along the way. Um, Dragon Quest Three Super Famicom, one of my favorite things about the speedrun is that it's played pretty straight up. Um, there are a couple of very small um, bugs that we take advantage of, uh, but for the most part, it's played pretty much straight. Um, Coburn, uh, it's a full party wipe. Uh, so yeah, Dragon Quest is always full party wipe. Um, but uh, yeah, so this, this run is played pretty straight up, which means we're not going to be running from a lot of fights. Uh, we ideally just want to get experience, get our levels up, get our stats up. Um, yeah, there are um, certain sections of the game where we'll try to run, and sometimes it's faster to run than to fight something. Um, so this is one uh, one of those speed runs where uh, you are kind of playing it by ear from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, Having a for broad the most part, understanding of the game and what's going on is going to lead you to making the best decisions. At this point in the run, since we gained those levels and my HP went up a lot, I'm free to run or fight encounters, and I can kind of decide what I want to do based on how the things are going. Yeah, um, the fights up here in the tower, in particular fights that include these mobs, uh, can be a bit of a pain, so you want to avoid them where possible. And then um, that last fight uh, that Dina ran from with the frogs and the ant bears, they just have a ton of HP and take a long time to kill. Yeah, value's not great. If I want XP, and I kind of do, uh, hey, walk there. Uh, it's. I've found it's recently, I think I've been leaning a little more towards just trying to take some encounters towards the cave. You can get some beefier encounters with things like bubble slimes and uh, the wasps. Yeah, those uh, fights, I mean, obviously the bubble slimes can poison you and the wasps deal quite a bit of damage, but uh, they're, they, neither of them have a lot of HP. Uh, so if you do want to try to get uh, hero to level 2, for example, or maybe get your soldier to level 3, um, th that's going to be your best bet for taking extra fights. And so now that door, we can only open that door um, because we got the thief's key. Uh, here in this pot, we grab an intelligence seed, uh, which is going to get sold for money. And then this old man is going to give us an item called the Magic Ball, uh, which we're going to be using in a moment to uh, get to our next location. <laughs> One thing uh, that you're going to see a lot uh, in this uh, speedrun is using Wings of the Wyvern to go to the town that we are currently in, <laughs> because uh, it's the fastest way to leave. Uh, it's, it's one of the funniest like things that like really like made me giggle when I first watched the speedrun, when I first learned it. It was like, hey wait, he just used a wing to go to the town he was already in because he didn't want to walk down some stairs. Yeah, it, it, it happens a lot in this speedrun. Uh, I can think of at least five different instances uh, where you wing uh, from the town you're in to the town you're in just so you can exit faster. Um, so this fight in particular, uh, we talked about hopefully maybe taking out some wasps. Um, those are the enemies on the left, but those enemies on the right, um, they cast a spell called Surround. Uh, what Surround does is, uh, if it works, uh, it's a status effect and it makes your physical accuracy go way, way, way down. Uh, and other than our wizard, who doesn't have very much MP at the moment, um, we're pretty much reliant on physical attacks. And so, yeah, this fight, Dina's going to have to run because... Uh, a full... I'm going to stick it out. Okay. Uh, a full two-thirds of Dina's party right now is, is uh, surrounded. So Warrior's good. A while Got one more fireball. Start. Let's go. Hero still hitting two for two through surround. Get him, Yusha. Nice. So yeah, uh, Hero does not get uh, the large uh, HP boost at level two uh, because we did not pump him with the stamina seeds uh, like we did with the other characters. Um, but uh, nice. for this next section of the speed run, uh, every every single point of HP counts. Every hit point counts. Uh, since this is a good time where it's going to be very relevant, you want to explain a little bit about how, one, the encounter system works, and two, about how running away works. We're going to do a lot of that, and I'm. this is part where I'm really at the mercy of RNG in terms of progressing. 
Yeah, so, Not this cave uh, so much in particular, but once we get to the next town, it's going to get bumpy. Right, yeah. So from this point onward, uh, we are going to be blitzing our way to the pyramid, uh, which is a place that you're not supposed to go to at level two. Um, and so uh, one of the things to talk about here, so run rates. Run rates are a pretty important factor in any RPG speed run. And the way running works, I I always fudge the exact numbers, uh, but I believe it the first chance, the first time you try to run away, so this battle we have right here, the first time you try to run away, I believe it is 30% to succeed. Uh, your second attempt is 50% to succeed. Your third attempt is 80% to succeed, I believe. And then the and then if you fail to run three times, you are guaranteed to run away uh, on the final attempt. Um, so here you see that Diener got away third try. Uh, 99 times out of 100, you're going to get away third try. But every once in a while, you do get that three straight run fills in a row. Classic. Uh, and the classic. And uh, depending on what encounters you get here, it's pretty rare for somebody here to die. However, it can happen. Um, these purple bunnies uh, that you see on the screen uh, are actually the most dangerous, arguably the most dangerous enemy here. Um, mm -hmm. They cast the sleep spell, and sleep is an extremely devastating uh, status effect in the Dragon Warrior series. Uh, we are going to be using it to our own advantage later on, mm -hmm. um, but right now we're at the mercy of it. And uh, unlike in other RPGs, if you punch a sleeping enemy or party member in the face, they don't wake up. Uh, they roll a chance to wake up at the start of their turn, and if they don't, they just sit there and continue to get pummeled. Um, this can be a little bit nasty, um, although yeah. we are right at the exit. This thing a little HP, but I'm not too concerned. We're almost through this cave, and we'll reach the next uh, castle town of Romali. Uh, we're going to take a, a rest up there before progressing forward. I assume you're going to be buying the safety gear as well. Uh, nope. I think I'm good. Okay. Um, you can, uh, from t uh, when you're first starting to learn this run, uh, there is a route that includes uh, some, some purchasing of gear here in Romilly um, to boost your defense a little bit. And it does not only help uh, with the stability of getting to the pyramid, but it also helps with the next section as well. But it is optional. Um, uh, once you get to a certain comfortability with the speed run, um, generally uh, picking up this gear gets skipped as we're going to do now. So we're just going to take the inn here. Um, the inn is important here, not just for getting our HP back, but also for uh, resetting the day-night cycle. Um, Dragon Quest 3, uh, the day-night cycle resets when you use there's wings. And, oh boy. Yeah, there's the triple <laughs> run fail right there. And uh, we got the uh, thief killed, unfortunately. But we will be able to uh, revive her in Ashalon, which is the place we'll be going next. If we make it. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, uh, the area that we are in right now, we are not supposed to be in. There is a not whole bunch all. of stuff that we are intended to do uh, before we come here. And so while there is an expectability of making it from Romilly to Ashalon and from Ashalon to the Pyramid and from the Pyramid to Isis, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the route that we all take. Uh, sometimes you just get pounded into paste, um, especially these uh, vampire-looking things can cast Ice Bolt for a lot of damage. Everything just kind of hits there. really hard, and yeah, it can be it can be kind of kind of nasty. Okay. This okay. looks bad, but it's not bad. This is good. It's actually completely fine. Uh, so there's an item here. Um, so this is a poison moth powder that Diener grabbed. Um, poison moth powders are actually going to be very relevant um, about an hour from now. Uh, but right here, the only reason that we're grabbing this is so that we can sell it for money. Um, it looks like, uh, yeah, Diener's going to go ahead and pick up uh, the fur hood. Uh, this is going cash. to, yeah, this is going to uh, boost the thief's defense power uh, considerably. Um, again, increasing stability for the next section. And then we also sold the hero's sword. Um, we don't need the hero's weapon for anything. Uh, and so we're going to um, use that to get money to revive our characters. Yeah, having a little bit of extra gold in my pocket, at least 30, is going to also help for some option selects uh, for this uh, pyramid section. Um, I've uh, used to race this game a lot with uh, my friend Popsan from Japan, and uh, 
I learned all different kinds of ways of handling problems in this section to try and minimize the damage because it's inevitable that you get beat up here a little bit from time to time. Sometimes it's good, but yeah, there's a lot of ways that you can optimize recovering if things don't go so well. Yeah, Dragon Quest Three really is a speed run where um, if you're if you're you know hunting for a PB, then things tend to go a certain way. But if you're uh, doing a no reset run or a race, um, you're going to be making judgment calls constantly. You're going to be uh, trying to uh, you're just going to be trying to optimize your decision making, and there are a lot of ways that you can do that. Um, there's a lot of kind of uh, room for expression uh, in the way that you play this game for sure. Yeah, there's definitely a core route that everyone follows because it makes sense, but there's enough room because of all the RNG for a little bit of uh, drone style. Um, so now uh, we have crossed into a different encounter zone um, now that we are on these desert tiles. This is a just genuinely disgusting uh, zone uh, to try to be in right now. Um, right there, uh, Dina um, took some armor off of the dead uh, warrior and gave it over to the thief uh, to again try to increase survivability in the section. Um, we really just want to see first try runs as quickly as much as we possibly can, um, because here uh, we're okay. So I did something a little strange there. That was an yeah. encounter cancel. We haven't really explained much about the encounter rate yet. So ooh, lucky. Oh yeah, enemies didn't see dinner. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Grandra, this will kind of uh, uh, pivot into uh, answering your question here. How much is the encounter rate understood in this game? So, um, that's a question I, I don't know the entire answer to, but what I do know is that, so there is a number uh, in the background of the game that is counting down towards the next encounter. And the rate that it counts down at um, depends on the tiles you're walking on. But the most important thing here, and the reason why Diener walked into the pyramid and then right back out, is because, uh, let's say the number, right before Diener walked in, let's say the number was at one. And if Diener had taken two more steps, he would have gotten an encounter. Going in and out of the pyramid resets that number and will allow Diener to walk further without getting another encounter. And that's the first time that you're going to see that happen, but you're going to see it happen a lot during this run, um, especially when we uh, go back to the pyramid from here. Um, the thing that we're really trying to get now, and you see it here too. So Diener takes a couple of steps um, and then uses that transition to uh, make it so that he can just get the walk to the pyramid completely free every time. So it's it's not exactly that we're like fully manipulating it. It's more like we're trying to tip the odds in our favor as much as possible. The general summary I can give is that if we just got a fight or we just left a town or something, then we're probably not going to get a fight if we walk around. We might, but we probably won't. And if it's been a long time since we've been walking around and haven't gotten a fight, then we're probably about to get one. Exactly, yeah. So you're kind of trying to... There's a, there's a lot in this run uh, that is routed such that you're trying to get your... Um, your encounter cancels uh, right as you would normally get an encounter. Um, here uh, in the pyramid, uh, the depletion rate tends to it, it is uh, fairly low. Oh, nice first try run. Yes, so lucky. Um, the uh, depletion rate is fairly low, and so usually you get two encounters while you're walking back and forth to do this uh, button puzzle. We have to press these buttons in a specific order. We also have to not go downstairs. You Oops. notice that Diener. Uh, was avoiding the stairs uh, because that would reset the puzzle. Um, but then after we've solved the puzzle, we do take the stairs uh, again to get that encounter reset, uh, which will more or less uh, allow us to walk up to the chest and get, we got the golden key and we also got a stamina seed, which we immediately gave to Tiro. Uh, and then, oof, most of the time you make <laughs> that walk without an encounter. Um, Wow, but okay. since we got the since we got the encounter, Diener was going to take the stairs, was going to go up and down the stairs again to reset that encounter rate, like we were talking about. But since he got the encounter, uh, he doesn't need to take the stairs. Um, but fortunately, it was a first try run from both those encounters. Yeah. No. Now will we get the Shadow Killer special? Shout out to oh, Shadow Killer. Even I've never seen that. <laughs> uh, I, I want to say tonic calculated that it was like a 0.1 percent chance of getting an encounter up there 
All right, well, we're almost back. This is the last step. I could have wing back to Isis, but that resets the day-night. If I do this carefully, as I have, it's actually still going to be nighttime when I get to the town, which is kind of important. It's just about to flip today, but I've actually done this a few times, and I know it won't flip. It's still nighttime, which means everything is perfect. A little bit slow to get the key, but everyone being alive and we're here at night, everything's going to line up pretty comfortably. So I'd say this is a pretty good start for... Uh, marathon run oh this is a fantastic start for a marathon run uh anytime you can get through the pyramid without wiping um even if it involves going a little bit out of your way uh, is a big deal um so here these treasure chests uh that we're opening up are part of the reason why we blitz for the golden key um we are picking up uh some stat seeds that we're going to give to our characters uh some items that we're going to sell for a ton of money uh, as well as some gear uh, that we're going to be handing out to our characters. Basically, uh, the route that we're doing here involves getting to the pyramid as quickly as possible and then selling a whole bunch of stuff for way, way, way overpowered gear. Uh, and then we're going to be playing the game uh, more or less as intended for about an hour or so. Uh, and then we're going to be moving on to the uh, Metal of Slime grind section that is present in pretty much every Dragon Quest game. Mm -hmm. This right here is going to be a pretty uh, pretty powerful menu boss uh, as I work to sell off a lot of this equipment and buy basically much more powerful armor for our two characters in the front. Uh, that'll make it a lot harder for us to uh, die, which is nice. Yes. Yeah, so specifically, uh, we're selling off a, a prayer ring. We picked up flashy clothes at the top of the pyramid. We picked up uh, some other things that we're going to be buying. Um, here, we're going to be buying gear primarily for the hero and the soldier. We're going to be buying a bunch of, like, uh, steel armor, steel shields, uh, steel helmets, uh, all, of, all of those kinds of things. And normally, you would not have equipment like that at uh, level 2. Uh, but that's going to help speed us through the rest of the game. And as Diener mentioned before, uh, not only does nobody know healing magic right now, but for the most part, no one's really going to know healing magic. I mean, the, he the hero will learn Hoimi or the basic heal spell uh, eventually, um, but he doesn't have enough MP to do all the healing that we need to do. And so uh, here we're going to be buying a ton of herbs because that is the only way uh, that we're really going to reasonably have to heal for quite some time. Um, we're also going to stock up on Wings of the Wyvern because, of course, they're incredibly useful for getting around the map quickly. Uh, we pick up a few antidote herbs for the next section. There is a small chance that characters could get poisoned, and we don't want to just let that sap our hit points. Um, and then we also bought some fairy or holy water. Um, holy water can be used to uh, ward off random encounters, and we'll be using that uh, after the grind section. Um, here we go down this well to pick up, uh, I want to say it's like the 100% bravery book or something like that. Uh, and we use it to change the uh, thief's uh, personality. If the thief gets tough guy, we skip this. But if not, uh, we do go for this book uh, to change the thief's personality to one that's more optimal. I want to say it has slightly higher agility growth or something. I'm actually mm -hmm. not sure about that one. I don't know if you know. Yeah, the fearless you. type. I'm pretty sure it's a little bit higher on agility, but still has pretty good stamina. That's a nice balance. Now yeah, we, we get... want... Um... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, we're coming here back to Aliahan, and even though the king didn't give us this stuff, now with the magic key, we're just going to go ahead and help ourselves. Some more fabulous treasure. Yeah, specifically here, we're getting the rune staff, which is going to be a really good weapon for our mage, and then we'll sell that later for money. Um, there's a little bit of money, and then there is a very important uh, accessory that we just picked up, um, the Kogetsu no Udewa, or the heroic armband. Uh, does a couple of things. Um, it boosts your damage output by, like, plus 20 or something 15 like that. attack power. 15 attack power uh and then it also changes your um it changes the personality of the character wearing it as well um so we're gonna be shuffling that around uh, at certain points um because it i believe it uh the uh personality that it switches you to has slightly higher attack growth but less hp growth than what we have now mm -hmm. i believe um, that's the case we're getting another important accessory back here in isis castle's basement yeah, the incredibly broken meteorite armbands. 
uh, which uh, most of you will be familiar with the starry ring, I want to say, as the more modern English translation basically doubles your agility. Um, we're going to have that sitting on the thief. Uh, one of the reasons why we pick up a thief, uh, there are several, but the biggest reason, okay, arguably one of the biggest reasons is the thief has naturally high agility. Uh, and so we're going to be using the Thief as our healer in some upcoming boss fights. And so the nice thing is that her naturally high agility plus the Meteorite armband doubling that agility means she's going to be going first, uh, like 99% of the time. Um, later, we're going to be class changing this Thief into a Sage. Uh, and we're going to leave the Meteorite armband on the Sage as well. And so again, having that naturally high agility transfer over uh, is going to be a big help. And it's also nice you didn't actually have to force a fight here. Hit on the spot I wanted. This yeah. run rate's been great too. If we can just get a little further and no lumps, I love it. Yeah, no so uh, most of the time when you're making this walk to Portoga, um, you'll kind of you'll have to walk back and forth on that exact tile that Diener got that encounter. We would normally walk back and forth and force an encounter there, and the reason for that is because when you walk one step down you get into a different encounter zone where there are different enemies. And the enemy that we absolutely do not want to see are lumps. Yeah, the druids. Uh, the, the druids. Uh, they cast the Inferno spell, uh, which, I mean, even if you, you I think they, I want to say they can come in packs of two and packs of four. If you see a pack of four, you're almost certainly dead, but even a pack of two can kill you uh, if they're rude enough and if you fail to run enough times. Yeah, the big problem is we've picked up a bunch of heavy armor, which has improved our defense power, but that does nothing against magic. We get shredded exactly. by magic. But that um, won't be a problem. We uh, did a little bit of shopping there. Um, here we're going, um, this is one of many little um, pit stops we're going to take where we go slightly out of our way to pick up a strength seed. That's going to go to the hero. Uh, we do want the hero strength to be as high as possible because of course having more strength means more damage. Uh, and all of that's just going to slowly add up over the course of the run. Um, and then uh, one thing I want to point out, um, one thing that's important that we picked up when we were shopping here earlier, we picked up steel whips. Um, we gave one to the hero and one to the thief. That's another reason why we pick up the thief is she can use whips. Uh, and whips in uh, starting from Dragon Quest V and then transferring over to subsequent remakes of Dragon Quest games, uh, very, 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 very powerful weapons because they can target an entire enemy group. Uh, and so they're going to make all the random encounters that we see uh, for about the next half hour uh, fairly trivial. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty interesting part of the run. It's going to start resembling something that looks a little bit more like Dragon Quest. Um, what ends up happening is, even though our levels are kind of low for these sections, our weapons and armor are extremely powerful. So we're going to have a pretty good advantage in fighting things still, and our levels are going to start skyrocketing. Yeah, exactly. Um, Diener is, is Diener is still going to be a bit picky about uh, what fights he chooses to take or not take, and that's mostly just going to be about what is uh, what he can kill faster. Um, so a single caterpillar is not a big deal, um, but if you see two caterpillars, um, you can take them out if they're in groups. But you can see this, uh, you know, he wiggles his tail here and. Uh, this caterpillar just cast the increase spell, uh, which is going to be valuable for us later, but right now it's just an annoyance because it increases the defense of an entire group and makes things harder to kill and is slow, and we want to avoid that, so we usually just run away from caterpillars. Yeah, there's a lot of different uh, things that I'll probably be evaluating for each individual encounter on whether I want to fight or run away. That's going to also depend on how things go. If I start having to run away from a lot of things and I'm not earning a lot of XP, I might want to be a little bit more uh, proactive about fighting something, and then on the flip side, if I've earned a lot of XP, maybe I don't want to fight as much. But exactly. good, certain, certain encounters are always just faster to fight, certain encounters are always just faster to run from. Yeah, that particular encounter, um, those dogs on the right, they're not too annoying. I want to say they have relatively high hit points, um, and so, but the crabs on the left have absurdly high defense power and just take a lot, a lot of time to kill. Uh, no, uh, Giramoni, correct. That shrine is not in the NES version. Uh, <laughs> that was added to the remix and is uh, what's called a Pachisi or a Sugoroku track. Um, it's a little bonus thing that you can go to to potentially win some fancy items. There are prizes. Uh, you roll a dice and it's kind of like playing Monopoly or Sorry or any other board game of that nature. Yeah, so Game Boy Color has it. Uh, Super Famicom has it. I'm sure the 
2.5 D remake that's coming out soon. Trademark uh, is going to have it too. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is not there uh, in the uh, NES version. Yeah. Um, one thing to one thing I, I just want to note really quick is that Diener popped into Kazav and went upstairs. Um, he grabbed a fur hood, which we gave to the mate, the witch for more defense, and also a life nut that we'll be using at the very, 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 very end of the run. Go ahead, Diener. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be pretty. Like this is not a fight is that I would normally take, but really having not earned XP, I would to make. It's not essential, uh, but as the mage starts to level up, starting at level 4, she has opportunities to start learning new magic spells, which is kind of neat. Some of them can be pretty handy for what we're doing here. We've come to Champagne Tower. We've got to fight um, this bandit here, uh, Kandar. Um, and unlike in the original NES version, there is a flag that requires us to complete this fight. We don't actually have to pick up the crown, but we do have to do this fight in order to progress the game forward. Yeah, if you're unfamiliar with any version of Dragon Quest III, um, there's kind of a basic plot point here, which is that uh, the thief Kandar has stolen the King of Romilly's crown, and so you have to uh, go fetch it. Um, or at and... least rough him up. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, you, the, ideally, you go fetch it, you come back, you get the option of being the king, um, which is a classic where you just kind of mm -hmm. walk around and talk to people, and there's really not much that comes of it. Um, but we're just going to beat up Kandar. In the NES version, you can skip this fight entirely and just walk right over to Baharata and fight the do the second Kandar fight. Um, but uh, yeah, here we are forced to do the first Kandar fight, which isn't a terrible thing. It's um, like I was just about to say, it was just as well because we're probably not strong enough to go to Baharata anyway. The counters there are a little bit stronger. Yeah, we, we get a ton of experience from the uh, from the Kandar fight, so it's actually not terrible to come here and do this. Um, of note, uh, the mage did learn um, the upper spell at mm -hmm. level four, um, which is going to be really, really nice uh, for this upcoming Kandar fight. Uh, the upper spell increases defense for one character. Um, hopefully we can get the mage to level five uh, before getting to Kandar, where she'll have a chance to learn the Ice Bolt spell. Uh, Ice Bolt, uh, an incredibly useful damage spell, uh, can speed up the fight a bit. Um, it's not the end of the world if the mage doesn't learn it, um, but if she does, it's it's a pretty big boost of damage. And yeah, Giramoni, no Bob, cra no, no bomb crag farming. We will uh, be farming uh, Metal Slimes uh, about an hour, uh, about 45 minutes or so from now. Um, but no, this, like I said, this run's played uh, pretty straight up. Um, we'll be, you know, we, we blitzed the pyramid to, to get uh, money for gear, um, but now this run's going to be played pretty much straight up. We're going to be fighting things in front of us and getting experience that way. And yeah, this is why we got those antidote herbs. Uh, we had uh, some poison, uh, Poison caterpillars uh, breathe uh, poison breath at us. A couple of our characters got poisoned, which is why the screen was flashing a moment ago. You take one damage per step if you're poisoned, so we do want to take care of that. Yeah, I actually don't have a bunch of antidote herbs, so just in case I got poisoned more, I decided to wait a little bit to to see, and lo and behold, we were in some more poison worms. So we're going to do some accessory swapping here. Now we want our hero to be as strong as possible and our thief to be as fast as possible for this battle here. Yeah, and so this is um, one of the parts in the run where um, really, uh, depending on the uh, way that you start the first round of this fight is going to depend on what spells your mage learns. Um, so we're going to start by attacking this goon in the front with everybody and having the uh, witch cast upper. Um, and from there, it's going to kind of depend, like we're, huh. we're going to be kind of playing it by ear here as we watch, like, who's getting damaged? Do we need to, you know, heal that person up? Uh, we can opt to increase, you know, cast upper on different party members. Um, and then once we have everybody uppered uh, and healed up, um, the fight uh, pretty much runs itself from there. Um, the one thing to talk about here, um, the interest, the nice thing about the Super Famicom version is you see these lovely uh, enemy animations here. Um, those animations can actually give you some information about what that enemy is trying to do. Uh, and so you may have noticed uh, at the very start of the fight, uh, Kandar did this two-handed overhead swing of his axe as opposed to the one-handed swing you see him normally do. Um, so the way that uh, enemy thing works, how, how, how enemies choose their actions in this game 
Um, they have eight different action slots uh, that they can choose from. Uh, and Kandar, uh, seven of those eight slots are regular attack. One of those eight slots, he will attempt to critically strike. So that's what he's, that's actually what he's doing right here. Um, now, he has a one in eight chance to attempt to critically strike. And then if he attempts it, he has a one in eight chance to actually critically strike. So it's a one in 64 chance of getting crit. We really don't want to see it. It's really the only way anyone will die. Um, if he crits somebody, they will die, guaranteed. Um, but at this point, we've got the, the goons are all uh, taken care of, and it's pretty much just way on. Yeah, he should be done right here. Um, oh. He's got one more shot in him. Now he's done. Yeah, I kind of slow played there a little bit. I was surprised. Normally that first goon dies on the first turn, so I kind of hesitated a little bit and made sure that my decision making was really what I wanted there to try and keep everyone alive. It is handy to keep everyone alive here. As you can see, everyone earns a lot of XP. It's going to gain several levels. Yeah, you're you're getting about three or four levels on average per character, so you really want everyone to be alive after this fight, especially the mage. The mage is going to get a lot of experience here and has the opportunity to learn a lot of very useful spells. Um, so here at level five, she gets her first chance of learning Ice Bolt, um, and then starting from level seven, she has a chance to learn Fireball. Um, if we pick that up here, that's actually going to be really nice. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, we'll probably get to level eight or maybe even level nine. Um, before we get to the second Kandar fight. Um, so hopefully we'll get Fireball before that. Um, just as another one of those things where, do I have Fireball? Great, that, that makes the next fight a lot easier. And if not, then we have ways around that too. So that's a, an important like moment, just to reiterate how much of this run is influenced by RNG, even whether or not we learn certain spells, very important spells later on in the game. It's left to chance, coin flipping. Hint, 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 hint nudge, nudge. Yeah, yeah. Um, a question about regenerating HP on bosses. Some bosses and even some random monsters can regenerate HP and some don't. We'll probably point those out in specific cases. Um, the big one is probably Baramos himself uh, has a pretty healthy regen and we play around that mechanic very carefully. But we'll get to that in quite some time from now. For now we've uh, showed the King of Portoga's letter to Noru the Dwarf. He's going to open this secret passage that leads to the town of Baharata. Kandar is up to more no good, no good necks, more roguery over in uh, Baharata. So we've got to head over there and uh, deal with him some more. Yeah, specifically, um, the king of Portoga wants us to get, uh, there's a mysterious substance that he's heard of coming from the east known as pepper, uh, and he wants to know a little bit more about that. Um, this uh, is a section, again, where encounter handling is important because there's kind of a prescribed way of handling uh, pretty much anything that you see, anything that pops up on the screen, we've got a way of uh, dealing with that as optimally as possible. Um, these death jackals can be really annoying because they have that surround spell and again that's going to reduce our physical accuracy considerably and we're still relying on physical attacks as our main source of damage however um you may have known a couple you may have noticed a couple of those jackals kind of like flew away in a beam of light um the hero uh i want to say it's like level five or level six is when the hero mm, learns six, the I expel think. yeah the expel spell um expel is an incredibly useful spell all throughout the speed run um, it's kind of taken from the basic concept of turn undead from Dungeons and Dragons. Um, basically, any monster type that is undead has a chance to be ex expelled. You don't get experience or gold, but you do make it go away. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of times in the speed run, and, and all throughout the speed run, all the way up till the very last dungeon of the speed run, um, there are going to be enemies that we would rather just make fly away than take the time to fight. Okay, pretty straightforward encounters along the way, that's fine. The hunter flies are pretty strong since they have uh, the fireball spell, but uh, we're seeing some good hustle from my hero who we stuck the um, meteorite ring onto. The thief Plus was naturally on that level. Yep, we're Even starting soldier. to get, we're gonna start seeing uh, those high HP gains on the soldier pretty much from here on out. We wanna see double digit HP pretty much every single time. So we're doing some more shopping here. We're buying these uh, magic shields. 
Uh, these have pretty high defense power, and is one of the only shield types that can be equipped by our mage in the back, but they also come in with a built-in damage reduction effect from magic spells. Yeah, that's going to be extremely um, critical for the place we're going to... When, when we get to the metal slime grind section of this game, those magic shields are going to be critical because there are enemies there that can cast the Firebane spell and like to do it a lot, and so we want to mitigate that damage as much as possible. Um, here, there's just a minor plot point. We have to talk to this old man, and he's going to tell you about how uh, Gupta, this uh, poor young man here, his girlfriend Tanya was kidnapped by Kandar and is being held for ransom and Gupta overhearing this he's like I'm gonna go save her um spoilers he's not gonna go save her we're gonna have to go bail him out he's no hero no hero uh so we're gonna go take this in and then here is uh the next point where again uh we're going to warp from uh, Baharata to Baharata in order to get out just a little bit faster. Um, Flare Solaris, uh, the Metal Slime grind, so you do see Metal Slimes in the volca Volcano Cave, I believe the NES version grinds there. We're gonna be grinding in a uh, Garuna Tower. Um, you do see Metal Slimes there as well. And oh boy, back attack by this is nasty. Yeah, this is not good. Um, these Hunter Flies on the left, as Dina mentioned before, have the Fireball spell. Um, it's the first time that you really start to see um, group target spells in this speedrun. Um, and the Ant Bears on the right, uh, just, they hit really, really, really hard. Um, not as hard now, um, because of the fact that we did pick up those uh, Magic Shields. Um, but they can absolutely take somebody out. Um, Hold they can on also... to your hats. They, they can also run away. Uh, it would have been nice to maybe see that. Um, but fortunately, everybody hustled, and we got some good damage rolls, and we got out of there. Normally, you make this walk from Baharata to the cave in relative peace, um, but marathon gonna marathon, I guess. Yeah, that was a little bit sketchy, and well, at least I made a good, smart decision trying to pick Ice Bolt there, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, you can opt to run from fights, um, I would say, in the interest of marathon stability, picking up as much experience as you can um, is always a good idea. Um, this fight in particular can be cleared fairly quickly. The Hunterflies don't have a ton of HP, and the hero usually makes at least one or two of the wolves go away immediately, so... Okay. Well, we're slowly making progress forward here. Eventually, we'll make it to this cave. We're going to pick up a bunch of bonus stat seeds here. We're going to give a lot of them to the hero, but we're also going to continue pocketing all the uh, life acorns that we get for the very, very end. Yeah, um, one thing to note is that, uh, so I had mentioned before that when you level up, the game looks at your max HP and compares it to your stamina, and if your stamina is higher than, if, if your max HP isn't where it should be, the game will boost your HP to catch up, um, but if, if your HP, um, uh, I assume the rates are the same, I am not as knowledgeable about GBC rates, neither you might know if they're different, I assume they're not. Uh, I think they're pretty similar. Mechanically, they felt very similar, um, but resistances are broken into four categories. Um, either the spell always works, it never works, it works 30% of the time, or it works 75% of the time, something along that. Yeah, it sounds about right. Um, here, we're just piling seeds onto different characters. Um, we gave a stamina seed, a speed seed, and a strength seed to the hero, uh, and we gave a, an intelligence seed to the mage to... Uh, increase her oh, uh, nice. next level she'll get a max MP increase and so now uh, we're going to advance the plot a little bit uh, we're going to walk up to these goons and they're going to be like hey did you want to join our group and if you say yes then you'll be like well the boss isn't here so beat it and if you say no then they decide to beat you up instead uh, so we have to fight a souped up version of Kandar's goons um, the biggest difference uh, 
between these goons and the goons that we fought before is these goons can cast heal more and they can also cast the defense spell and this is where um a small glitch uh can be used uh so right here um our party just got hit by the defense spell and so while menuing the next round of actions diener is going to note uh who got hit by the defense spell whose defense got lowered and there's a little glitch in this game where if you go into the equip menu and just choose any piece of equipment even if it's a piece of equipment that's already been worn and uh choose to equip it again the game immediately recalculates your stats and basically just removes the deep buff um it's really one of the only unintended things that we do wow, in this double game miss. um yeah that double miss is pretty rare and unfortunate um counting on my hero for damage i can't have him missing but uh yeah, uh, this fight, you know, sometimes it can get a little wow. bit dicey if, uh, oh my goodness, that is incredible. A little unlucky. sloppy on my part, but this is not going well. Yeah, we're, yeah, it's a little unfortunate. Um, normally we like to take these guys out and then do the next fight with Kandar 2 in one shot, um, but... Uh, it's not gonna happen. Oh well. Yeah, we're, we're gonna have to pop outside and uh, bring it's our level nine, though. back. Can I, can I get outside, please? Yeah, outside oh. would be really nice here. I got Gira and Increase, though, so I guess I'll take those. Yeah. Um, Gira, the Fireball spell uh, is useful um, for the next fight, and the Increase spell is incredibly useful uh, for the next fights. Uh, will make things uh, a lot more stable. Um, but unfortunately, uh, yeah. we are going to have to head back to Baharat and revive. Hopefully I don't get lost in here. Yeah, it's pretty rare that you have to walk out. The walk of shame. Oh, well. Yep. Uh, sometimes uh, things happen in the marathon. Um, unfortunately, the warrior just got uh, punched a few many, a few too many times. Yeah, I was um, a little greedy. I probably could have stood to him with the thief instead of attacking, but I was getting a little patient with how much the hero was missing. But I made my choice, and I'll live with it. Or the hero or the warrior will not live with it, as the case may be. Now oh, he's back on his feet, and we're ready to go back in there. Thief actually gained a lot of HP on that level, which is pretty important. I looked at her HP earlier before that fight, and it's quite low, but now it seems a little more normal. Yeah, the hero missing. I mean, the hero does the most damage. Um, by far, and then, and, and not even accounting for the fact that the hero has a whip and is hitting multiple targets at once, the hero is actually just, in terms of attack power, the strongest person in the party. Yeah, and it's even worse because the damage output from the whips is higher on enemies on the left and lower diminishes as you hit enemies on the right, and I kept missing ones on the left would do the most damage, so I was really missing out on a lot of damage there, and it... Oh well, whatever. It's over, and we're going to move forward. The next fight, because those gun guys won't come back. Yeah, fortunately we don't have to fight those goons again. Um, we're going to just go ahead and continue on as normal. Uh, so we're going to um, go down here, and Gupta is going to tell us to go press the uh, switch on the wall to open the doors. And they're going to do a little dance, and everyone's going to say, Yay, we get to walk back to Baharata. It's all happy. On. Okay. Yeah, one thing uh, the remakes added is a uh, nice little uh, you go into this context menu and you uh, can heal your party up to full. Um, the game will automatically try to be as efficient as possible with MP. And so uh, Kandar 2 is back, uh, so we're going to beat him up. Um, he's got a little bit more HP. Um, these goons are like the goons that we saw just a moment ago. They have defense and heal more. Um, and so we're going to be applying the same techniques here. If our defense gets lowered, we're going to go ahead and fix that. Um, and ideally, um, nobody gets uh, heal more. None of the goons heal more each other. Um, we actually uh, take a specific set of actions here to try and reduce the chance of heal more being cast um we started off with fireball against the goons in the first round and then we go with ice bolts in the second round um because the goons will only try to cast heal more if their hp is low enough unfortunately 
Uh, the thief got outsped, and uh, yeah, she went dead that, last. Yeah, Not all of that. The thief, yeah, the thief would have uh, taken that goo down, but uh, anyway, it's it's not a big deal. Um, again, because we picked up that increase spell uh, after the the goon fight there, um, we do get to just increase our defense to the maximum in the most efficient way possible. Um, it's actually kind of rare that you, it's uncommon when you put it that way to have the increase spell here. Um, you'll notice now that Kandar is basically doing uh, single digit damage. Um, so Diener's gonna throw out some Ice Bolts with the Mage. We do want to keep, uh, I believe it's 6 MP, um, but we want to keep on the, uh, yeah, 8 MP on the Mage, um, in order to cast outside at the conclusion of this fight. We really don't want to walk back out of this cave. Um, again. But, again. <laughs> um, but from here, it's pretty much hold X and win. Um, one thing we didn't talk about is that in, uh, Japanese RPG speedrunning communities allow the usage of Turbo. Uh, and so Diener's got a turbo controller. He's just holding down the X button right now. This this fight is really the only thing that can happen from here is Kandar might crit. Um, he does have a slightly higher chance to crit uh, than he did in the first fight. Um, but for the most part, yeah, hold X and win. Yep. Just take a couple. Wow. Well, this guy is actually quite a bit more uh, bulky, uh, though, than his first version. So... My damage output hasn't improved that much, so it will take me a few more turns. As much as I'd like to say this fight is almost over, it's probably going to take two or three more turns of steady, steady bashing. Yeah, with uh, if we didn't have the increase spell, we'd be seeing our characters take a little bit more damage, and then you'd start um, looking at how many herbs your mage has. Uh, when your mage uh, runs out of herbs, you usually are close to the end of the fight, but... Uh, here at this point, we're going to have uh, quite a few resources left Cruising. over, and there he is. I saw another 17 there. I didn't see what uh, the soldier got on level 10, but uh, HP's got to be at least 130. All right, important spell I was hoping to learn earlier that we always get by level 10. We got the outside spell. This is along with the return and the wings and stuff. It's going to make uh, just sort of zooming around the world really easy. So we're going to quickly get out of here. I'm going to do a little Tori shuffling. Then we'll get back to Baharata, and somehow Gupta and Tanya got back before I did. Yeah, and as a thank you for uh, bailing them both out of that uh, messy situation, um, Gupta's going to go ahead and give us a bunch of pepper for free. And we're going to go back to Portoga, and we're going to trade some pepper for a boat. Um, I know that spices back in the old days were expensive. I still feel like the king is getting fleeced here. <laughs> Of course, with Dragon Quest Three, a big a part of it, if you look closely at the world map, a lot of it is an analog to uh, the real world. And we have a town like Portoga here is a Portugal thing, so it's all about the spice trade and uh, the age of exploration and that kind of thing. So, um, that's question where it's in all chat. Thematic. Is there going to be a trick to finding the ghost ship later? Um, I actually don't know exactly how the ghost ship works, but what I do know is that once we pick up the Sailor's Bone, which we will be getting because obviously the ghost ship is required, um, the ghost ship does not spawn until we pick up the Sailor's mm -hmm. Bone, and then it always is right outside of Romilly. I don't know why. I don't know if it can appear other places under different conditions. Um, but as far as the speed is concerned, um, it is always, always, always going to be just southeast of Romilly. Um, so we'll be getting there pretty quickly every time. Yeah, the the ship itself won't actually appear on the overworld to find until we get that item, which is going to require right. us to do the boss troll. That'll come a little bit uh, less than an hour, but... Right now that we have a boat, we're going to use the boat to sail around a bunch of different places in the world. Uh, in some cases, I want to hit up some shops for some special items. In some cases, I want to pick up some special items for use later. And in other cases, I just want to stop by that town so I can come by later. Whoa, we got the Siouxland battle again. Oh, I saw this wow. recently in practice. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that before, and now I've seen it twice. The marathon luck is uh, extremely real right now. Oh, we got away from them quickly, so yeah, sure, whatever. No harm, no foul. Okay. Um, there uh, we picked up an agility seed uh, 
from a pot there. Um, again, there are different periods of time. <laughs> nice uh, menuing there. I would have talked to that lady. I don't think I've ever actually manually searched before. Uh, I'm impressed. Uh, there we picked up the Thank Ikazuchi you. staff or the staff of thunder. Um, free fire, uh, free fire bane in combat or kisses uh, is the modern English translation. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, we're going to be using that extensively in the grind section coming up here. Um, it looked like you bought the mohawk hat, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to yeah, be some I'll... advanced tech for Zoma. Yeah, well, we... I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that later um, for mm -hmm. sure. We'll, we also that one in the back pocket. We also purchased the um, the what's called an invisible herb. They sell those there in Sioux and also I think in Lancel, but it's going to be convenient for us to come back to Sioux later uh, for the bug powder. Uh, so that's why we. Uh, purchase one of those. We're going to need those to get into the town of Edinburgh later. Um, for anyone who came late uh, to the to the speedrun, um, just to go over it again really quick, uh, the reason why Diener got off the boat and went into that cave there um, is to... So there's a number that's ticking down in the background. Um, when it gets to zero, uh, you get an encounter, and you can take a bunch of steps and then uh, go up and down any set of stairs, in and out of any town, in and out of any cave, and it will reset that number, which is what allowed us to sail from Aliahan to this uh, Pirate's Cove without getting a fight. Um, here, we are picking up one required item. That red orb is a required story item. Um, we get also the uh, Rockstar Ring, uh, which is pretty useful accessory um, that we'll be using later on. Uh, I think we get a string seed there or a life nut. I can't yeah, really string seed. Bird chest. String seed. Okay. Um, and so now we're just going to be continuing our kind of around the world. It's pretty customary in a lot of uh, Dragon Quest speedruns to get the boat and then just sail around the world uh, in a specific pattern. Um, there we go in and out of Japan. Um, we just want that as a return spot later. Uh, we'll be going there after the Metal Slime grind, which a lot of the sailing around that we're doing right now, yes, we are getting return points, we're doing um, little odds and ends here, um, but uh, we're also preparing for uh, that Metal Slime grind. Uh, we're going to be picking up some items to sell, and we're going to be buying some stuff um, that's going to be really important. And uh, so we just uh, got the return point for Dharma, uh, which is where we're going to be doing some class changing later. Um, but from there, we're going to be going up to the castle of Edinburgh, uh, which is, again, why we picked up the invisibility herb, because there's a guard standing outside of Edinburgh Castle that will not let anybody in, and so in order to sneak by him, we need to turn invisible. Um, there, like I said, we're going to pick up some items there to sell, and we're also going to pick up a required plot item, the Thirsty Pitcher. Hmm? So, um, yeah, we did go to that pirate hideout in that secret little spot in the bo bottom and get the red orb. Of course, our main quest to defeat the demon lord Baramos, we're going to need to help some help getting to Baramos's castle. Uh, and in order to do that, we're going to need these six special colored orbs that are hidden around the world. We're going to get the red orb now, but we're not going to go collect any of the other orbs until after we're finished leveling up. Uh, right now we're going to spend some time in the middle section here, earning a lot of experience to level up so that we can basically just uh, progress forward from the rest of the game, earning experience as we go from the bosses we need to defeat and just kind of uh, really just like uh, straight shooting to the very end once we do that. Um, this is uh, a little bit of old school game design that I just find really interesting. Um, it's very clear that the developers of Dragon Quest Three were fans of Sokoban, uh, and so they just decided to add a Sokoban puzzle to Dragon Quest Three because reasons. Uh, and so those uh, little patches of water, um, it is possible to accidentally push a boulder into them. Um, but uh, the nice thing about this puzzle is that uh, while the boulder is moving, you have quite a bit of time to buffer your next input. Uh, so it's pretty easy to do uh, that puzzle efficiently once you learn the solution. Yeah, we'll see more rock pushing and uh, another Dragon Quest RTA later on. Uh, for sure. Um, here, uh, we are going to pick up the most uh, critical piece of equipment um, for this upcoming section of the speedrun. Um, we're picking up Poison Needles. Poison Needles is a unique Dragon Quest item, uh, a weapon, uh, that either deals one point of damage, I believe seven-eighths of the time, or one out of eight okay. times, uh, it will... Um, 
One out of eight times, it will instantly kill the target. Um, the other nice thing about poison needles is that uh, they are guaranteed to do one damage to a metal slime and still have that one out of eight chance to uh, get an instant kill. Um, you'll notice here that uh, Diener just made a whole bunch of money. Um, he, one of the items that we picked up in Adam Bear is uh, the fancy suit, uh, which just sells for a ton of money. And we're going to use that money to buy specifically what we're stocking up on here is poison moth powder. Um, poison moth powder is going to be incredibly important for this upcoming grind section. Uh, what it does is when you throw it at an enemy, uh, it has a chance to confuse that enemy. And this can work on metal slimes. Uh, I want to say it's a 30% chance to work. Is that correct, Diener? No, the metal slimes are like 75%. It usually 75%. does work. It usually does work. Okay. So yeah, 75% chance to confuse a metal slime. If a metal slime is confused, uh, it will try to attack its uh, allies. Um, but the most important thing is that if a metal slime is confused and any other monster is present in the fight, that metal slime will never run Not away. run away. Yep. It will never run away. It's it's uh, so again. I mentioned before that uh, enemies have uh, eight actions that they can choose from. I believe metal slimes are are uh, have three out of their eight slots are run slots. Um, but when they're po when they're confused, uh, those eight those three slots turn into just regular physical attacks. And so you see that that little animation, that little gold bubble animation, that was Keener using uh, the uh, poison moth powder, and he did get the confuse off. So that metal slime, uh, because there's this uh, lumpus here, that metal slime could not run away. We were actually guaranteed to kill it. Uh, and getting a metal slime before we even enter the tower is actually really really nice. It's kind of, yeah, that's nice, definitely. I'll take it. Uh, the early levels will pick up uh, uh, max HP and strength and agility and stuff. We'll just make our party stronger for fighting anything that isn't a metal slime. Hopefully we it, see lots of metal slimes, but we're going to see plenty of things that are not metal slimes. Uh, well, especially here on these lower floors, we're not going to see any metal slimes down here. But We're going to work our way up to the f upper floors of this tower, and the encounter rate for metal slimes is going to be pretty good. We're going to hang out there and use our poison needles and poison moth powder to rack up a bunch of XP. Uh, we're going to split this grind up into two different parts. This first goal of our grind is actually to get our thief character, our second character right now, up to level 20. Uh, that's because we want to do some class change stuff. You want to talk a little bit about how that works? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so those of you familiar with any version of this game know that the Book of Satori is hidden in this tower, which is required for turning a character into a sage. Uh, we are going to be turning our thief into a sage. Um... And so uh, if you're familiar with the base game, um, you'll know that you have the option of changing one party's class into another class. Uh, they get reset to level one and they have their stats cut in half. Uh, however, uh, because we're going to level the Thief up to level 20, uh, her agility is going to get very high and that's going to make the Sage's agility also very high. Uh, so you, you do get that little bit of carryover from uh, one class to another. Um, in the second half of the grinding section, um, we're going to be trying to get, we're, we're going to be getting our Mage to level 21 to learn the I kill spell or twin hits, I believe is the modern English translation. Um, basically, uh, oof, that's right. Um, oof, uh, the, major, oh. the modern translation. Um, but, uh, oh dear. Uh, yeah, this place can be uh, a little bit uh, unfair. Um, again, these, uh, these birds on the screen like to cast Fire Bane, which is again, the reason why we have those uh, magic shields. Uh, Flare, yes, that is correct. Uh, we left the merchant back at Aliahan. We're going to be picking up the merchants uh, later uh, to go do the new town qu side quest. Yeah, the merchant will have her time to shine a little bit, but for now, uh, she's going to stay nice and safe in the friend bank. Um, but to continue to talk about class change for a little bit, so um, one of the things, when you change from one class to another, you keep the spells and abilities that you had learned from the previous class. Uh, and so that's going to be very important because I think it's like level 18 or 17 or 18, the thief learns 
arguably the most powerful spell in the game. Um, she learns Padfoot, I think is what they call it uh, in the English translation uh -huh. now. Um, basically, uh, I've mentioned uh, a handful of times that there's a number that is ticking down to the next encounter. And when you use the Padfoot spell, or Shinobi no Ashi, um, that depletion rate is cut in half. It, essentially, we have the encounter rate for the rest of the game, and the spell is free. Um, so that is the real reason. There are many reasons why we choose a thief, um, but Padfoot or Shinobi no Ashi is uh, the main reason. Um, yeah, she far. gets she gets high agility for things early on in the run. That's helpful. She can use whips. She can use poison needles. She has tiptoe for later. It's there's a whole like laundry list of reasons why the thief is really powerful. It looks like I'm gonna pick up the double kill here. Yeah, it's really great. Uh, as Diener had mentioned before, um, one, one thing to mention in general is that in a lot of Dragon Quest games, um, you get these grind sections, and the nice thing about them is that as you, as everybody levels up and as you sort of progress towards your ultimate goal, uh, you're you're going to be stronger, and so uh, the fights that don't have metal slimes are going to take less time to clear. You're going to have more tools to clear them. You're going to be stronger in general. Um, you're going to notice that the warrior is now dead. Um, that's on purpose. Uh, we, the warrior doesn't need any more experience from this level. Um, experience in this game is split among party members that are surviving. So we want the, the um, warrior to be dead to funnel more experience into the characters that benefit the most from it. Um, that being the thief, mage, and hero. And we're going to pop upstairs here and uh, pick up this treasure chest. This yeah, I'm going to grab it in a has... second. Yeah. My inventory is still full, so I'm going to wait to use something. Um, but uh, yeah, there's going to be uh, a useful item. Uh, the uh, golden barrette uh, is in that treasure chest. We bought one for the mage in Sue while we were buying our poison moth powders, and then we get a free one here. And that's the helmet that we're going to be using pretty much for the rest of the run on both the mage and the uh, thief. Okay. Um, and then also, uh, just one other thing to mention is that uh, once the uh, mage learns my kill, um, we're going to turn her into a soldier so she has access to better gear, um, but then she also gets to keep that my kill spell. Oh, unfortunate. Metal Slimes can have either 3 or 4 HP, <laughs> and unfortunately that one had 4. Yeah, I could tell that one had 4 by the way my character's targeted, but just needed to stick around a little longer. But oh, nice. oops. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a good thing to, to talk about really quick. Um, okay, yeah, I guess that's fine. Um, the way that characters target uh, in battles is interesting, can actually give you some useful information. Um, so we're gonna watch and see. So, okay, so you notice that um, Diener's party members are targeting this slime on the right. Um, this that means um, this slime on the right only had three HP, and the slime on the left had four. Okay, um, your party dead. members, yeah, your party members will always go after uh, the target with the least HP, uh, and so we actually can deduce that the slime on the left had four HP, and because it took two damage and did not run away on the next turn, uh, we knew we were going to kill it because uh, the poison needles. We have two poison needles, and they always, always, always do one damage. Mm -hmm. Also got a speed seed drop, so that's nice. Yep. The bonus, uh... I think that was a steal, but yep. Bonus agility never hurts. Oh yeah, that's another thing that we hadn't talked about. Um, one nice thing about the Thief is that she has this passive ability uh, to steal items. It basically Hello, increases boys. your... Uh, it basically increases your chance to get random drops. Um, the item that the thief quote unquote steals is the same as the item that it would have dropped regardless. Um, you love to see, you can see fights. I want to say there's three, four, six, and seven metal slime configurations that can possibly appear. And uh, any time that you see just a group of metal slimes by themselves is always ideal. Um, and then ideally you can fuse at least two of them uh, so that, uh, you can confuse them both okay. and they won't run away. Uh, ideally, There's we can needle. pick these two up here. Oh, some needle. There's our first instant kill. We should get Good this. Good hustle. Uh... <laughs> it had one HP, but 
I think I okay. insta killed both of those that only had one HP. But so far this grind yeah. is going really well. I'm getting a lot of fights that are just metal slimes. Um, the there is a lot of dynamics to this part of the game, even though it's kind of just fight metal slime sometimes. Um, there's a lot of dynamics to how to fight the other things, how to use your moth powder, different ways that you can use it, depending on what your goals are, and things like that. So there's a lot of, uh, like I said, dynamics or flexibility to this part. Uh, it's a very active part. It's not a uh, walk back and forth kind of level grind. There's a lot of details, a lot of things I'm trying to mentally keep track of. Uh, swapping back and forth between these weapons is a critical one. Um, I want to use different weapons on my hero depending on what the situation is in order to you know, maximize my my clear speed uh, depending on what it is that I'm fighting. But forgetting which weapon I have equipped and using the wrong weapon can, can cost me time in a lot of different ways. So that's just one of the many different factors that I'm trying to weigh as I'm trying to go through this part of the yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah, when you're learning this speedrun, um, I mean, learning the route is one thing, but when you're trying to go for a really good time in this game, um, sub three hours is kind of the goal that um, a lot of people strive for when they learn this run. Um, the, the the grind here, this Garuda grind, is really one of the sections that you want to work on the most because uh, obviously um, the Metal Slams have to show up and you have to be able to kill them, um, but there is so much optimization uh, that goes into decision making in this run. Um, as Dino mentioned, um, your thief has a steel whip and a poison needle. And there are certain times where you want to have the poison needle equipped and certain times where you want to have the whip equipped. Um, your, th your hero has a steel sword and a steel whip. And there are certain times where you want to have the steel sword and there are certain times where you want to have the steel whip equipped. And then your um, mage has the uh, thunder staff for free firebane. Uh, and so really this is one of the first parts in the run where any time you get into a fight as soon as something pops up on the screen there is more or less uh an ideal way to handle that fight and handling that fight um may change depending on the level that you're at it may change depending on what you have equipped currently uh and so again there's just a lot of variables that you're constantly keeping track of and even like what spells you learn or don't learn over the course of, of the grind uh, can also change things. Yeah, uh, the Blazemore spell uh, is a good one, a good example, as well as uh, Snowstorm at level 20 is a possibility, but not a guarantee. Um, another big factor is like how successful or how effective your moth powder has been. Uh, right now I've been getting a lot of kills without having to spend a lot, so I can feel comfortable about being a little bit greedier with it later on in the run if I want. I know I won't have any issues uh, going into the second part of the grind with how much powder I have as long as I play, you know, reasonably efficiently. But that's something yeah. I'm keep trying to keep track of as well. Uh, as, I yeah. might try to, as I might try to play more conservatively when I'm using my moth powder if I'm starting to run lower. Yeah, uh, uh, playing around your moth powder is obviously important. Um, I mean, you could just go in throwing your moth powder willy-nilly at everything that you see, and uh, maybe you'll get a lot of kills that way, but if you run out of moth powder, then you're really at the uh, at the mercy of RNG. You're out of um, gas, yeah. It's not, yeah. especially in that second grind when you only have one poison needle to use, it's very hard to kill things without it. Very uh, and so... Uh, just now, as the mage uh, hit level 17, that's when she learned the uh, Marami spell, or Blazemore. I do not remember the modern name of it off the top of my head. Kafriz? Kafriz? Yeah, Kafriz. Is Kafriz single sounds... target, or is it Sis? Sis, Sis is, is multi-target, so Kafriz, yeah. Um, so yeah, we got, uh, yeah, uh, Marami, Let's do it this um, Blaze Marker Frizz, uh, and that, uh, is gonna be potentially useful. Uh, Frizzle, thank you. Okay, yeah, um, you're right. I'm bad at it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, that, that's gonna be potentially useful, as, again, as, as Dino put it, um, earlier, there are a plethora of option selects in this game. Um, and, uh... And I'll take it. 19, we're doing well. Yeah, we, we're actually doing really well. Um, the Metal Slime Grind is a place where if you're having an average or below average run, um, getting good luck in the Metal Slime Grind can propel you forward by quite a bit. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, the Kerfrizzle spell uh, or the Frizzle spell uh, will generally uh, one shot one of these birds that you see on the screen. Um, so uh, so occasionally there are some situations in which uh, it's your best option is to just take that bird out immediately. So what we're gonna want to do here is we nice. take the bird, we take out the bird. Uh, and then we confuse both the moth and the metal slime so the metal slime can't run away. And one thing that we haven't explained yet up to this point is that when enemies attack other enemies, and especially when enemies attack other metal slimes, the damage calculation is different. You'll notice um, that moth actually did six damage, either five or six damage to that metal slime, and just killed it in one hit. Um, that is the thing that we uh, factor into our decision making uh, when trying to handle encounters. So, for example, here uh, we want to get these birds out of the way as quickly as possible. So, the hero and the thief are going to take these birds out. Um, Diener threw a poison moth powder at one of the moths to confuse it. And so, we're going to get rid of the birds. The moth is going to attack one of the slimes and kill it. And so, here we have we've, we've, we've uh, planned out our actions in a very specific way to make what happened happen. This is what we're talking about when we talk about optimizing fights. Here, we just got a second metal slime kill, and we didn't use, we only used one powder, I believe. Um, I killed all Diener, three of them. Yeah, Ooh. we got all, all three of them. And again, this is why, I mean, this is really where you see an encounter on the screen. How do I handle that encounter? How do I get my inputs in fast enough? And how do I make the decisions um, that are going to give me uh, the biggest advantage? Wow, one slime, I think? Are you just going to leave and pick up the experience? Yeah, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to wrap yeah. up here. Um, I love that you were explaining what my strategy was and then it actually worked because that can very perfectly. easily not work that way. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's actually working exactly the way I want it to. Look at that. All the... Yeah, all the uh, yeah, all the slime stuck around instead of you throwing a powder out and watching them all run away. <laughs> um, so here, um, nine, 99 times out of 100, you're going to take the, the thief to level 20 and then leave. Um, but as an optional, uh, you have the option of leaving a little bit early. We know the thief is going to get level 20 at 32,202 experience. And Diener saw she was about 400 experience off of that. So we're going to come to Japan a little bit early and uh, get started on uh, the next, uh, preparing for the next section of the run. Uh, so again, uh, Diener just cast Shinobi no Ashi or Tiptoe. Uh, this is going to be the start of the point where we just cast Tiptoe constantly uh, throughout the run in order to minimize the random encounters that we get. And we're going to sail north. Um, we're going to pick up, we're going to pop into this town here for a moment. Um, and then head up north to uh, some shoals in the middle of the ocean. That's why we did that boulder pushing puzzle before. We picked up this item called the Dry Vase or the Thirsty Pitcher. Uh, it's going to reveal a cave, which is going to reveal the final key, which is uh, very much required to finish the rest of the game. You might say it's a key item. Oh, boy. All right, that's that's it. I'm done. That's my last one. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so we're gonna pop into the town of Moor here. Um, this is one of, this is the only town <laughs> I know of off the top of my head that does not pop up on your return list. I want to say there are a couple of other towns that don't show up, um, but this is one of them. Um, and so we're gonna pick up a couple of optional items here. You can pick up Ortega's Helm. Um, it does involve, like, a short cutscene, and you have to go up and down some stairs to get it. It can be optionally sold for some money. Um, but for the most part, we just skip it. Um, we pick up an item to sell later. We pick up another life nut that's going to be used at the end of the speed run. And then we mosey on our way. Um, one thing we can talk about here, uh, while Diener sails north and, uh, summons the cave. Um, one of the, um, important parts of this speed run, uh, in terms of optimization is inventory management. Inventory management is so important. And it's one of the reasons why you really... Uh, you do need to be able to read Japanese in order to do this run. I mean, that seems kind of obvious, uh, but it's really important because your items uh, ideally are going to kind of sit in the same spots in your inventory, but not always. Um, you're going to get random drops from time to time from enemies. Um, so you need to be able to know what is where. 
Um, but we're also constantly going into the menu and going into our bag and into our into our character's inventory slots um, to keep items where we we know where they are, uh, so to speak. We want to know where items are so that we don't even have to think uh, about, uh, you know, if I need to use the um, Staff of Thunder, for example. I know exactly where that is in my menu. I don't even have to think about it. I just go straight to it. Um, that that kind of thing is extremely important. And so here, uh, we're going to be seeing uh, Diener do a little bit of menuing uh, as we prepare for the second half of the grind. Um, the second half of the grind is, the as a, again, we have these kind of minor goals, these kind of things that we're looking out for. But the big goal here is to get the mage to level 21. Uh, that is when we have our first chance to learn the buy kill spell. Um, and uh, one thing we didn't, we talked a little bit about spell That's learning before, good. but not a lot. Um, spell learning in this game uh, is um, interesting, uh, to put a word on it. Uh, there, at certain levels, your characters have a chance to learn a certain spell. Um, there are spells that will check your character's intelligence, and if your character's intelligence is fairly high, they can learn spells early. Um, those kind of spells have a level where you are guaranteed to learn the spell if your character's intelligence is abnormally low. However, there are also spells, uh, that just have a flat 50-50 chance of being learned, and uh, Bike Kill is one of those spells. Um, starting from level 21, Bike Kill has a 50 50 chance of being learned, and that is true all the way up to level 99. It is theoretically possible to have a level 99 mage that does not know Bike Kill. Um, the odds of that are obviously astronomically low. Um, but You'd have to sit happen. there and save scum levels there for quite a long time to do that, yeah. I bet. But. Uh, but yeah, theoretically possible. Um, and so what that means for us uh, is uh, when you're doing um, when you're doing a marathon run like this, um, we're going to be getting the mage uh, at to as close to forty five thousand six hundred and seventy six experience as possible without going over. Um, Dieter mentioned save scumming. We are definitely going to be save scumming by kill here. Um, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure somebody's working on it right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're going to be keeping an eye on the experience as we gain it um, because uh, we want to, uh, in, uh, in in PB attempts, um, you you don't want to save scum. You just want to go fast and take the, take the R&D that you get. Uh, sometimes you do try to go up to level 22 to maybe have a chance to point it there. But for the most part, in PB attempts, this is where the vast majority of PB attempts die, uh, is your grind just either isn't fast enough or your mage doesn't learn by kill at 21. Yeah, this can definitely be a, a make or break part if you're looking for a good time. But, you know, if if you're uh, if you're looking just to complete the game, uh, there's definitely some steps that you can take to make it uh, a little more uh, manageable, a little more stable, although it's still a somewhat unpredictable part. And who knows, if I get the right encounter at the right time, I might just go for it. Yeah, I mean, going for it is always an option. I mean, we can just uh, stay here as long as our powder lets us. Uh, and since uh, the first half of this grind section was uh, fairly efficient, uh, we can afford to play a little bit more loosely with the rest of this grind. Um, one thing we're also looking at here is obviously we class changed the uh, thief into a sage, and that sage is level one. And so, alongside getting the uh, mage to level 21, um, the uh, sage is going to be leveling up also. And one nice thing about the way the experience is routed in this run is that uh, your sage is going to be, generally speaking, hitting level 14 right as your mage is hitting level 21 and that's actually a fairly important level because that's when the uh sage learns heal more and that is an incredibly important spell um for obvious reasons because it heals more than the heal spell does uh and is going to be our pretty much our sole source of uh serious healing uh for the boss rush uh, that is going to be coming up as soon as we finish this grind. Yeah, session. it's going to seem strange, but our most powerful healing spell for a good chunk of this, even for a lot of powerful bosses, is 
mid heal. One person has mid heal. And then that's gonna be enough to get you through Baramos? Really? Yeah, no, I promise. Uh yes, we will be getting the Sage of Stone. You can't be you can't beat Zoma without it's, it. Yes, absolutely we will be uh, eventually doing that. Um hang on, let me think carefully about what I want here in this encounter. It's a little a little complicated. Now let's go back. Again, um, Diener is making choices here about what to throw powder at and, uh, you know, what, what targets to attack. Um, yeah, so we we got both the Moth and the Metal Slime confused. So again, the Moth's going to take out the Metal Slime. We take out the Moth and uh, everybody is happy with uh, the experience here. Diener Everyone is going to... The hero. Yeah. <laughs> Diener's going to have everybody attack the hero here. Um, we want the hero, I want to say level 16 is when the hero learns stop spells. So uh, it's either 18 get... or 19. I noticed earlier when he reached level 18, he learned it. So I am already was like, okay, if I get an opportunity to, to, to kill him, then I can take that opportunity if I want. There is some pro-con uh, advantage, disadvantage to, you know, killing him early. He's very strong and is very good at killing other enemies that are not metal slimes, but he doesn't contribute much to fighting metal slimes other than throwing moth powder and um, uh, doesn't really need any more experience now that he's reached this kind of level threshold. Yeah, so uh, this is just another um, option select. Uh, you can choose to kill off the hero to funnel more XP into the Sage and Mage. Oh boy, are we going to get the uh, Paralysis special? We might. Uh, so one thing about these moths here, um, I, I talked a little bit about animations before. Whenever you see these moths do this licking animation, they have a chance to paralyze one of your characters, and if all characters who are alive are paralyzed, it counts as a party wipe, uh, which is um, not terribly common. It can happen here, uh, because obviously we only have two characters that are alive. Um, it's just something to kind of look out for. Um, as we make our way towards our goal of Mage 21. Yep, I'm getting punished for killing my hero early. All these non-metal fights. Oh well. Sugodoku ticket! Time to go play some parts easy. Only there was enough time. Or if the prizes were any good, or if we could reliably win any of those things. There is the uh, Sugudoku domination category for this speedrun. <laughs> I believe there are three tracks in this game. Uh, uh, I think there are, counting the secret track, there are five in all. Um, there are three uh, in the oh, yeah. above world, and there's one in the dark world. And, and there's one, one in the bonus cave. Uh, that makes sense. Or it's one of the prizes from the Divine Dragon. You wish for the bonus Pachisi track. I can't remember where it is now. Is it in Jipang's Well? I've actually never... I, I, I've played the ones in the Overworld and the Game Boy Color version. But I played I, a uh, ton of Game Boy Color version, version back in the day, so... Yeah, the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color version. No, th since so this version of Dragon Quest Three does have a translation patch. Um, there are some people who have learned uh, to do this speedrun by playing the English version first. However, the text in the English version uh, makes the run about ten to fifteen minutes slower on average than a Japanese speedrun. So, pretty much. Uh, any uh, anyone is going to be uh, anyone who's seriously running this game is going to run it in Japanese. Um, but if you want to play this uh, this version, um, uh, higher resolution than the Game Boy Color version. Um, other than that, for all intents and purposes, they are the same. Um, there is an English translation patch available for your enjoyment. Aside from some small adjustments to the encounter rates, huh? Well, we won't go too much into that, but uh, we got a pretty decent fight there now. We got to level 20, but I did not learn the Snowstorm spell, which is kind of a bummer, but it can be pretty handy in dealing with the uh, non-metal stuff, but yeah, not required. And now it's where I'm going to start being a little more particular about where my XP is. I want to kill two more Metal Slimes from here, not too much else. Oh, and they didn't see me. Thanks. Oh, hey, it's Shenron and the boys. And this the boys. Is, uh, I think 
I think this is what you were talking about. This is where you just go all in, right? We'll start by fighting them and see where it takes us. Uh, killing they two would be great, but um, we might not get that many, so it probably won't be worth it to go for more than two at this point. I'm not likely to get all four. Yep, I'll just try and pick up... Oh, well, there's one. There's two. Now, if he could bail on me, that would be perfect. Should be 14 and not 21. I've actually blown this in a marathon before, so I'm going to look at my card again. Do math again. My math life is hard. <laughs> I think you can. I th no math. Oh, you can't. Take I can't. A bear I can't fight. take bears. That's yeah, what I was looking at. You can't take a bear at. fight. Yeah, you got to go to Dharma. So yeah, so this is where we uh, decide to just go ahead and save Scum um, because again, um, the way that it actually works is uh, when your character is leveling up. Um, you get several screens, uh, you get several um, bits of text in the window. Um, first it shows your HP and MP gained, then it shows your strength, stamina, etc. gained. And then for um, characters that can learn spells, it shows the spells that you learned on that third screen. And it's as you are pressing the A button to get to that third screen that the game rolls based on the frame whether or not you learn the spell. So I guess technically it's possible to manipulate it, but nobody nobody actually does that. And yeah, this um, is this is a no category. So Right. Well I, I I've never even I've seen manipulated runs that get like metal babbles and stuff. I've mm -hmm. never seen a run that tries to manipulate no, I, don't, I haven't seen anything like that either. But that kind of stuff is not something that they generally permit in this kind of category. You'll see me maybe stopping to save the game repeatedly here. This is just me trying to calibrate my experience right into the sweet spot to get as close as possible to this level without actually getting it. Yeah, if I end ideally. Up getting a bigger fight, then that's gravy, but I have to not quite make it, that's okay too. Ideally, we get ourselves into a position where one fight gets the level, mm -hmm. and so if we have to reset a bunch of times, we can do that fairly efficiently. Got just enough. If we see two messages, that's good. If we only see one there at the very end, that's bad. So we're yeah, definitely we going to learn Snowstorm. That's one of those guaranteed ones at a certain level. And uh, if we see Bi Kill, Bi Kiruto, that's what we. Uh, that's what we really. Yeah, and if Diener had gotten Snowstorm at level 20, um, this is again where you could do an option select where Diener would be fighting around Edinburgh instead. Um, Edinburgh has enemies that are much stronger, uh, give much more experience, uh, and also are just fairly susceptible to the uh, Snowstorm spell. They also tend to come in um, single groups, uh, which just with the whips and uh, the Snowstorm spell, they just are really easy to take out. Uh, with 129 experience, uh, we are at the point where it's basically a reset, fight, level, and uh, hopefully we get Michael here in short order. And then uh, we move on to the much more fun and interesting half of the run, so to speak. Yeah, uh, well, once this level grinding is finished here, and it's almost finished, we're a coin flip, winning a coin flip away from progressing forward, it's going to be pretty much all... Uh, story and and boss fighting and adventuring. Okay, there we go. Second try. Seems good. 135 is not even bad pace, considering how slow I felt like we got to the tower. I think we did okay there. Yeah, no, 140, 135 is fantastic pace uh, for this setting. Um, so yes, now, yes, player, uh, correct. So now that we have gotten the bike hill spell, the grind section is officially over. Uh, we will not be stopping to grind. I mean, we'll still be fighting random encounters or choosing to run from them. Um, Diener's going to be making those decisions on the fly. But for the most part, we're going to be fighting everything that's in front of us. We're going to be fighting bosses, and that's where we're going to be getting the vast bulk of our experience for the rest of this run. Um, so now, yep, so orb gathering time. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to hit the town of Baharata. And uh, that's just the fastest way to get to Lancel. Lancel uh, has a special cave. Only one person is allowed inside, and in that cave is the blue orb. We're going to be sending the sage in there. Um, the sage has the highest HP of characters that are alive. <laughs> um, but of course, she also has that um, padfoot or Shinobi Noashi spell, uh, Tiptoe. 
Uh, so it's gonna significantly reduce the... I want to say oh. you can get through that cave oh. with as little as, like, three wow. encounters. this is really oh. bad manuing on my part. I'm using Ouch. the wrong things. All the wrong things. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. Yo, what's up, Dick? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Hey there, friend. Alright, um... Yeah, if fighting stuff here is kind of optional, but picking up this XP is actually going to boost my warrior up like four or five levels. Actually, I might go straight to level seven? B6? Yeah, this is just going to get a little bit of uh, HP on our mage warrior here. Um, to just make it... It's optional, but uh, every little bit of HP helps for the uh, boss troll fight, which is going to yeah, be it's, coming up it's... after this. Our next f boss fight is going to be against the boss troll, and it's not uncommon to fight that with the way I run things at with that mage warrior still at level 1. Uh, but picking up some levels isn't going to hurt, and we're going to gain these levels eventually, I guarantee you, so it's not like loot time or anything to get in the level later anyway, so... Yeah, boss troll would get um, the mage warrior to level nine uh, if she was wow, level one. Wow, look at this encounter! Fight. What? Two steps on a forest with tiptoe. I love it. Wow, oh, I have never seen that in my life. Um, flare. Uh, they're both have tricky bits uh, for different reasons. I would say Orochi is the scarier fight. Um, boss Troll, we have ways of mitigating what he can do. Um, yeah, I but... would say for Boss Troll, if he doesn't kill me in the first three turns, I've got him beat. Orochi, there are two different parts to that, and we'll get to those parts as we get there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, every, every boss in this uh, part of the game uh, has things that make it nasty and things that make it not so much. Yeah, nasty. like, um, we've got we've got strategies and plans to get through things, um, but our levels are cutthroat as possible, so there's there's not exactly anything that's going to be easy, but we are also well-equipped enough that we should be able to handle uh, most situations. Every now and then it gets too bumpy to handle, but... Uh, the rare Montan before the Blue Orb... <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm getting beat yeah. up. Not every day you take that much damage going through here. I've already um, used here... other MP. I'm gonna... Oh, we we're going to take the in and uh, hate on. So I'm not even concerned. Yeah, not at all. Um, here we picked up the uh, Daichi no Yoroi, or the Terra Firma Armor. I have no idea what it's called in modern translations. In the That's NES, right. it's Terra Firma Armor. Um but uh, that's going to be a nice piece of gear that we're going to give to the soldier for about 30 seconds and then immediately turn around and sell it for money, um, which is a common theme in this run. Uh, so, yeah, it is. Yes, I believe that happened to Diener and uh, not having heal more has happened to me, I believe, twice. Uh, very, very, very rare, but it does happen from time to time. Yeah, the sage with no increase at level fourteen. I was I was panicking for a second in that run one time. It was a while ago, but I was like, "What's gonna happen if I get to Baramos and she doesn't have increase? This is gonna get weird." She picked it up after Orochi, though, so it was all fine. So we picked up the uh, blue orb from the cave next to Lancel, Naval of the Earth, I think is what it's called. Um, and so now. This is, uh, just from a game design and routing design perspective, I just find this really interesting. We go to Portoga, and we're sailing down to Tadon to pick up the green orb, and almost at exactly the halfway point from Portoga to Tadon is this little, uh, shrine that not only resets the encounters, uh, the, the, the encounter rate, so nine, 99 times out of 100, you're not going to get an encounter between here and Tadon, um, but also, there's a priest here that can revive our characters, and so it's just, it's so incredibly convenient that it's kind of mind-blowing to me that we can revive our characters that we killed off in the tower, we give the uh, terraforma armor to the warrior, and then we're just off on our way. It routes to being nighttime here as well, which is also a requirement we need to progress this stuff. 
Yeah, Tadon is a town of ghosts or undead or something of that nature. So you see all these NPCs here. They are only here at night. Uh, so yeah, the fact that it gets to night, um, just in the, the amount of in-game time, the amount of in-game time it takes from getting from Portoga to Tadon, just also uh, one of the reasons why, I mean, this route has been it's... honed in over years and years and years and years. Yes, Flair, we will be getting the Darkness Lamp. Yep. We're going to go upstairs and grab it. Um, we talked to that guy and get the green orb, and now we've tripled our orb count. We're halfway there. Three down. Uh, but now we're going to work on doing all of the steps necessary to get the silver orb, which is a long chain of events. So it's going to be a while before. Don't remember where to go. Go to Edinburgh. Yeah, there's a kind of a, a little meme uh, where you end up going to Edinburgh several times over the course of the run because it's just a convenient return point for uh, other locations you want to go to. Uh, so we always say, if you don't know where to go in the second half of the run, it's probably Edinburgh. It's, uh, so it's, from here... Yeah, it's kind of strange because like you don't actually do any town, but you need to go to it several times. Yeah. Yeah, Whenever after we get the doing. after we get the thirsty pitcher, we don't need to go. Yep. All right, so we're taking this passage here, and once again, we'll need the final key. Uh, if you noticed, we needed the final key for those other orbs that we got too. That's kind of why we didn't worry about getting more orbs early. We had to get to the final key and stuff like that. So now that we have tiptoe, the final key, and everything, we can the darkness lamp. We can start progressing forward. In fact, now that we picked up the darkness lamp, I'm gonna use it, and we're gonna start using it in interesting ways. It's handy for some quest triggers that require nighttime, sure, but I'm flipping it to nighttime. Why is that? So again, um, just like with the town and stair transitions that we've been doing throughout the run, um, using the darkness lamp resets that number that's ticking down in the background uh, towards the next encounter. And so if we hadn't used the darkness lamp there from that walk to that shrine to this town of Samanosa, we would have been guaranteed to get an encounter. Um, but again, because we use that darkness lamp, uh, we there is a very specific spot where we use the darkness lamp to make it so we don't get an encounter. Ideally, we would have walked a little bit further without getting this encounter, but uh, Dragon I'll Quest take the first Dragon flea. Quest. Yeah, the first the first flea is very nice for sure. It's actually faster to get a fight in first flea than to use the lamp, but yeah, the lamp functions as like an encounter reset, a way of kind of mitigating the battles that I get if used in certain ways. Now, it doesn't always work in my favor as I'm just drawing a new number. I might draw a bad number. Uh, but it also sometimes is the case that you get a fight sooner than you anticipate and it kind of loses its its value. So there is a little bit of flex that you have with it. All right, uh, things are mostly set up here and we progress through that smoothly. So I'm just gonna grab a couple items here and do some shopping while I prepare for next boss fight. Yeah, this is one of those spots where we go just a bit out of our way to pick up a bonus stat seed. That was a uh, an agility seed that's gonna go to our sage later. And here we have another strength seed that's gonna go to our hero later. Um, we're going to be doing a little bit of buying and selling here. Um, this is going to be one of the last buying and selling sections for quite a while. Uh, and one of the one of the wild things, again, the routing in this has been honed so much and locked in so much over many, many years. Uh, and so, so much of the equipment that we get is upcycled into new equipment. Like there's nothing that just sits around in our bag. Every last scrap of gold that we can get out of equipment that we buy is going to be uh, paid forward into right. uh, future gear. Fix that. Um, and so uh, here we're going to be buying a zombie killer, which is going to go to the warrior. And then we're going to buy a bunch of dragon shields. Um, the sage, unfortunately, cannot equip a dragon shield. She's going to keep um, one of the magic shields that we bought for her earlier on the run. Everybody else, though, the two warriors and the hero are going to get dragon shields. The incredibly important thing about these shields is that they mitigate damage from breath attacks. Uh, and we're going to be seeing a lot of that. Um, boss troll does not have a breath attack, but pretty much every boss we're going to be fighting after boss troll does. Mm. Uh, so those dragon shields are incredibly valuable. Baramos in particular has the strong fire breath attack that under normal circumstances caps out its max damage is 100. So cutting that down by 75% is, or excuse me, by 25% is a pretty big deal. 
Yeah, uh, we don't want to see the Intense Flames Breath attack uh, regardless, uh, but uh, yeah, without those shields, uh, it would be almost a lost cause. Um, here, we're just picking up yet another uh, Life Nut, uh, Life Force Nut. Um, again, those are going to be going to most likely our Pure Soldier. Um, when I say Pure Soldier, I mean that, that character that's got four letters in his name, um, the one that does not get class changed. Uh, we're going to be giving those to him towards the end of the run, but here... Uh, we picked up the Mirror of Ra, uh, which uh, uh, those of you, some of you may know, dispels illusions. And it turns out that this was a fake king who was a uh, boss troll in disguise. And so here, so this boss troll, um, I mentioned uh, earlier on when we were fighting Kandar that what uh, the animation that an enemy uses can tell you what it's going to do. Um, the boss troll is actually, his actions are scripted. Um, he's always going to regular attack and then do a defense spell, uh, lowering our defense. And we stop spelled him to keep him from casting that. And so now he's basically going to be going back and forth between regular attacks and attempts to crit. Anytime you see him rear his club all the way back and swing, he's trying to crit. And he can do that throughout the entire run. However, now that we've cast increase about 50 gazillion times and maxed out our defense... One second... Yeah, so an important part of this setup is that one of the interesting properties of this buy kill spell that we've learned is that in addition to doubling uh, the attack power of the uh, target, it actually uh, cancels out their ability to score critical hits. So that's why I've actually, if you paid attention, used buy kill on the enemy, on the boss troll. That's caused him to increase his attack power, sure, but he can no longer crit me. Since I've increased my defense power, he really can't hurt me too much. And the scary thing about his critical hits is that they ignore my defense power. So there's really no way to protect against that other than by doing this little technique here. From here, the fight's going to be pretty stable. I'm really just trying to hit this sap spell. Um, if the sap spell lands, which doesn't have a high hit rate, I think it's only 30%. But if it does hit his defense, yeah, like this, he's going to start taking w way more damage. And this is where you can opt, uh, opt to uh, also cast by kill on the Sage for even more damage. But uh, yeah, when you land that sap, the uh, fight ends pretty quickly from there. Um, yeah, so I forgot <clears throat> I had an alarm set on my phone uh, and that went off. So that was that little interruption there. Um, no problem. But uh, yeah, so we open this fight by having uh, the hero and the soldier defend. Um, that will cut the uh, crit damage in half. So if boss troll does crit before we get the buy kill off, ideally he crits one of the defending characters uh, and so they don't die. Uh, but uh, yeah, if, uh, if, if you're, he crits anybody else or if, if you're not defending. If your sage gets bopped in those early turns, you're basically toast. If your mage yeah. warrior gets bopped, you can still win the fight, but you're at the mercy of him just not deciding not to crit. Right? And your damage output is also much lower too. It's not a good time. Generally, die if somebody in your care in your party dies before you can get the setup going. But once you get that setup going, it's pretty much eh, locked in. Sometimes the damage rolls can be a little bit wide. He'll do like single damage, digit damage, and then suddenly do like forty out of nowhere, and you're like, "Hey, where did that come from?" But yeah, there's a weird like in this is one thing that I picked up from the Dragon Warrior randomizer community. They talk about defense breaking. Um, the game does weird calculations when your defense is higher than an enemy's attack power. Uh, and so I suspect that 1 to 40 range is part of that defense breaking mechanic. His attack power just happens to be so high that it it rolls a certain way. I feel it's a similar thing to what's going on. Why then enemies deal extra damage to metal slimes. Right. Okay, we're using the change rod here. I'm trying to use this store, which requires me to change my form. They won't sell to uh, humans. Oh boy. That took a long... That was like eight usages or something like that. It's pretty good. Yeah, Aboshi, unfortunately, the prize for doing that side quest is... Uh... Well, nothing really. Um, we do pop in and out of that town to use it as a return point later, and uh, Diener also picked up another Strength Seed. 
Um, but really, uh, what we're doing here is uh, taking advantage of the ability to use this shop, which sells items we can't get anywhere else. Um, specifically, we're picking up two sleep staves. Um, they're unique to the remakes of this game. Um, they are free usage of sleep in combat, which is just invaluable for the rest of the run. Um, and uh, we also picked up a couple of prayer rings. Uh uh, Flare, I'm not actually sure. Uh, I, I've i seen it happen as a rare drop, but I've never thought to try it. Um, so it might, it does change your sprite, so it's possible that, that, that it'll let you uh, use the shop, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that I don't know. Um, but yeah, so we picked up some sleep stabs there, uh, which can be incredibly important. And we also picked up some prayer rings, uh, which are absolutely critical to the run uh, because... Um, Prayer rings are the only way that you can uh, restore MP outside of going to an inn. Um, so ideally, we're not going to be using those until we get to the Dark World, um, because they do have a, an approximately 1 in 10 chance of breaking, uh, and uh, ideally they don't. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, incredibly precious items. And so now that we are done uh, using the Staff of Change, we've done all the shopping that we need to do, we give the Staff of Change to this old man. Uh, we don't ask what he's going to use it for. We just uh, get the Sailor's Bone from him and run away to the town of Romilly. And it was asked before how we get to the ghost ship again. I don't know exactly how the ghost ship spawn works, whether or not it's going to be in a different place, depending on different factors. But for speedrun purposes, it's always going to be right here. Uh, in this little uh, lake area just uh, southeast of Romilly. And uh, we're going to um, pop over and pick up an extra uh, strength seed that, again, is going to go to the hero. And then we're going to pick up the lovely memories, uh, which we're going to be using to dispel a curse and pick up yet another item on this series of fetch quests. We're almost done the, the chain of events here. If you've been keeping track, we needed to get Rosmir to fight the boss troll, defeat boss troll to get the change staff, trade the change staff for the sailor's bone, use the sailor's bone to get onto the ghost ship, get onto the ghost ship and get the lovely memories here, this keepsake. And then we're gonna use the keepsake to break this curse at Cape Olivia in order to get an item called the Gaia Sword. From yeah, there, man. the Gaia Sword will unlock the way to a dungeon called the Necrogond, where we can finally, finally get our hands on the Silver Orb and some other goodies along the way. Yep, and here is going to be another example of that encounter canceling I was talking about before. Uh, to create Doritos, yes. Um, you know, uh, Diener popped in and out of that shrine again just to reset that number that's going to tick down to the next encounter. That's also why he used the Lamp of Darkness, and he's also going to use it right yeah, here. here. Yep. Um, so once we make it night, that's going to reset the encounters again. And so that's how we're able to get all the way from no annuals, uh, down to this cape, uh, without getting any encounters. Oops. And so I meant to menu the shrink seed too, but yeah, fine, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And here we get this nice little cut scene, uh, with the, uh, lost lovers, um, Olivia and I can never remember Eric. the other guy's name, Eric. Uh, they're finally reunited in the afterlife. That's what it and says here, right? It, more or less. Uh, yeah. And so uh, then uh, we can sail forward into the shrine to pick up the Gaia Sword, as was mentioned <laughs> before. Yeah, so it's really important that this whole combination of tiptoe and knowing how the encounter rate works, we can kind of, like I said, we're not really truly manipulating it, but kind of tipping the scales... Th fixing the cards in our favor as much as we can, stacking the deck in our favor as much as we can to try and avoid as many fights as possible. Each fight we get into that we don't really want slows us down to that little bit more. But this yeah, is the... one section in particular, like this dungeon that we're going to, that's completely different if you don't have this tiptoe spell. Yeah, if uh, Dr. Mr. Holmes is still around somewhere, uh, I know when he was running Dragon Quest Three on the NES and then he would come watch me run the SOC version, it would drive him nuts how low the encounter rate is <laughs> compared to the NES version. Um, yeah, this is a section of the game we're going to head through that uh, the enemies are very powerful. These are some of the strongest enemies that we're going to encounter in the overworld uh, leading up to the, the final stretch of the 
this part of the part of the game. Uh, and I'm also not particularly equipped well. There are some option selects here, but I've gone the route where we just go ahead and sell the hero weapon. Uh, I do not have any like truly good way of fighting a lot of enemies here. But we are going to use these sleep stabs and some other spells and things that I have to try and just distract things long enough to run away. But yeah, here's where we use the Gaia Sword. We hurl it into the volcano, and it's going to erupt, and that's going to fill in this part of the river and let us pass. Mount Dorito. Yeah, these little uh, triangle polygon things that come out <laughs> are supposed to look like lava, and they uh, they look like Doritos chips, so we Spicy like to call it Mount nachos. Dorito. Spicy nacho Doritos. Uh, tidy. Okay. Yeah, this is um, one one thing that you notice is that Diener occasionally changes his party order. Um, there are multiple reasons to do that. Um, here, we want the sage in front just for, honestly, for the sake of menuing. Um, it's going to put, it, we, we're going to be casting uh, Shinobiashi a lot. Um, and oh, uh, we're going to be also... Uh, we're going to be using the darkness lamp a lot, and so we just want uh, the sage at the front of our menu just for ease of using those items and spells. Um, and there uh, was uh, the first display of how incredibly useful sleep stabs are. Um, there were uh, four frost clouds there. They can cast snowstorm, which does a considerable amount of damage. Uh, and fortunately, though, they are fairly susceptible to the sleep spell. Uh, and so, uh, by putting them all to sleep, we just, uh, run away and no harm, no foul. Uh, Flair, yes, that is correct. So the lead party member has a 40% chance to be hit by a physical attack, and then it goes down from 10% there. So the character in the back has a 10% chance. And so there are times where our party order is based on who we want to be hit and who we don't want to be hit. Um, but for this section of the run, it really is just more convenient to have the sage on the front for menuing purposes. Uh, think about how to with this. Yeah, this is kind of a gross fight. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can handle um, different things, uh, but uh, trying to figure out how to optimally handle everything um, is... It, you, the you usually see uh, maybe two or three encounters in this cave tops. Um, that encounter felt like it came a little bit early. It definitely did. Um, but uh, fortunately, uh, we this troll is susceptible to sleep. Um, the skeleton on the left is susceptible to nifidam or expel. And so yeah, uh, we well, the Dina mentioned before we are relatively under equipped, uh, but we do. Sleep is just so, 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 so useful. Um, a moment ago, we picked up the Thunder Sword, which is going to go to the hero. And here we picked up the Blade Armor, which is going to go to the pure warrior in the second slot here. Um, the Thunder Sword is just an incredibly powerful sword that the hero is going to be using for quite a while. And the Blade Armor is a very strong piece of equipment that the warrior is going to have for the rest of the game. Uh, not only is the defense power high, but any time the warrior is hit by a physical attack, it reflects, I believe, one-eighth of that damage back towards the attacker. Oh, it's higher uh, than that. It's like one-half. Uh, oh, oh, really? Yeah. No, Zoma gets crushed by that stuff. Um, I, I had never actually paid attention to the fraction, um, so I, I believe it, uh, but it's, uh, it's regardless, it, 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 it reflects damage, uh, and that's going to be useful for pretty much every boss fight. Uh, Diener, I, <laughs> that clip of the Baramos self-kill from, I, I can't say, believe it was last that. week. I can't, I've, I've never, ne never ever have I seen that. <laughs> I've seen plenty of bosses kill themselves on blade armor, but never Baramos. But, you know, yeah. whatever, I'll take it. The very first time I ever beat Zoma when I was learning this run, it was the blade armor self-kill, which uh, you see a lot more often on Zoma than any other boss. But yeah, never, never Baramos. Um, so here we are. We've picked up a couple of items. We've made our way through um, this rather confusing dungeon. Um, but we know the way. We have the way memorized. And so... Nice. Uh, just got a little bit more to go. Hey, didn't see us. Free run. Always Maybe. nice. Um, but yeah, we're going to pop out some stairs. We're going to go talk to an old man. We're going to get that silver orb. And then from there, we're going to head to Japan. Uh, are you going to take an in first? 
Uh, yeah, I spent a little too much there, and for the sake of a little bit of safety, rather than just burn extra prairie, it's good. I'll just uh, take a quick uh, pit stop over to Samanosa. Their inn is convenient to take. It's right here at the entrance of town. You pay a little more for the convenience, but we're in a hurry. It's worth it. Yeah, one thing that uh, you take into consideration when optimizing things in this run is uh, Samanosa has the closest inn to the entrance, and uh, <clears throat> Kazav has the closest church to the entrance. So in the second half, if you ever need to revive anybody, you want to go to Kazav. Um, but here, uh, we're going to go ahead and beat up Orochi. Um, there is a dragon here in this cave uh, that has been demanding sacrifices. And uh, we need to go beat him up in order to pick up, I believe it's the purple orb you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to have purple orb here. This is a two-phase fight. The first fight is uh, a little bit, I would say, weaker and can fall asleep, but also has if it wants to be aggressive can be just as strong as the other one can be really so uh this strong fire breath attack is probably the most powerful thing it can do and it opened the fight by doing it twice oh lovely um this is not an unrecoverable situation by any means but it is definitely it's the worst thing that we too. can see happen also surround mist uh Things are going well yeah, this might get a little bit dicey. Okay, so surround hit, so that's good. We get our bite kill off here. Third strong breath attack in a row. Four in a row. My goodness. Okay. This is, bad. This is four. Okay, so just a note here: Orochi can do a strong breath attack. A weak I'm gonna get breath party attack, wiped. Or a physical attack, and we. I have. I have never seen this happen. I have 100% never seen this happen. Hang on to your and, ass. And course, now, all right. So now we get now we get the physical misses. So we took no damage that round. That's why we uh, cast the surround spell uh, to make the physical attacks miss. Uh, but uh, it looks like Diener is going to stabilize here. Uh, so we should be able to clear this fight. We are going to have to leave and revive that mage warrior. Um, but. Uh, my goodness, this you know, is the this rudest thing, Orochi this, one I've ever seen. This thing can take either one or two actions per turn. I've seen double actions virtually. There's a single turn, but wow, lots of double turns, lots of strong breath. I got very well cooked, um, and I don't like that, but whatever. The fight will clear, and we'll uh, recover. Yeah, Not nine times out of ten, you clear this pretty comfortably uh, with nobody dying. But uh, yeah, six flame breath attacks in a row. Uh, not a whole lot you can do about that. Um, you do get a prize for beating this up. The uh, Kusanagi sword's going to go to the mage warrior. I have to make sure and follow the, the monster through the portal here. It's actually a required trick. I can't just cast outside. Yeah, if you uh, make the mistake, if somebody dies and you make the mistake of uh, just leaving immediately and reviving, you do have to fight Orochi 1 again. So we go through the portal and here in Japan uh, and uh, make sure that uh, that trigger is set. Yeah, you want to uh, make so sure that... you uh, yeah, hit that flag before you move on. I'm actually uh, slightly patting myself on the back. I made sure to sell something earlier so I'd have enough gold to revive somebody if someone died. Look at that. It's like this has happened to me like 18 times. I think I'll just um, go ahead and take another in. See why. That's. Yeah, yeah, I think it's better. Seems kind of be safe. safe. With, with, with the way things have been going. Yeah, this uh, is too bad. Two, uh, Orochi 2 can be a little bit um, nastier. Uh, now, uh, that Orochi 1. Uh, Apparently didn't have a weak breath. Orochi 2 definitely doesn't have weak breath and is not susceptible to sleep. So she's going to be doing two things, breathing on us and biting us. Uh, and so we're going to try to mitigate that as much as possible. There are a couple of different ways of handling this fight. Um, I like to do the 2x increase, 2x yep. defense opener. Um, yep, I'm going to be doing the same. Optionally, you can go for surround. Uh, it's a little bit quicker. You start getting your damage in a little bit sooner. Um, it's just one of those things that's uh we've talked a lot about how much of this run comes down to player preference uh and the orochi 2 boss fight the way you choose to open up is one of those things 
but yeah, we are gonna do. Uh, we're gonna have two characters defend and two characters cast increase, and it's gonna mitigate the damage that we take in this opening round as well as uh, for the rest of the rounds. Um, and from there, we're going to cast sap to oh. lower Orochi's defense. I forgot to move that sword, didn't I? Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, ideally the uh, mage warrior would have the Kusanagi sword uh, for some added damage. But pretty sure uh, I forgot to move it. Forgetting to move that over is not uh, not the, the deal breaker. The nope. And uh, it's not even the first time I've done this, so it just makes the fight a little bit slower. Uh, Which could you... be a little bit s sticky if things go like really poorly, but I'm gonna have to slow play a little here, but I think I'll be okay. Yeah, the Sage has plenty of MP because we went back and took the inn. Um, the Sage having the Sage in our first slot here is uh, it's important that she has enough MP to make sure that she can heal uh, through the fight. Um, with our defense being what it is, uh, I believe it's 80, 60, 60, 60 is the line. Uh, as long as the Sage has 80 hit points and everyone else has 60, uh, they cannot die. Um, so that's the HP line, the HP values we're looking for. So yeah, Diener had the uh, Mage Warrior go ahead and defend there, uh, just to make sure that uh, she stays alive. But oh my goodness, this is just spicy on both ends. Okay, fortunately we got the weak breath attack there. I was wondering whether or not the uh, hero was going to survive or not. Um, this is also another point um, where decision making is influenced by the fact that we are counting on the sage to always go first. Uh, so even though the uh, it's the last round, the hero's HP was kind of low, oh, um, but we're counting on uh, the sage to outspeed Orochi and heal uh, so that uh, we can you know, deal damage without having somebody die. Uh, but uh, yeah. That was uh, painfully slow, but both of whoop. those fights were awful. Bad luck on both ends, just with how aggressive the monster was being. So, yeah. We got through it, though. I also forgot to move that sword, but it doesn't look like I would have had many opportunities to swing it anyway. Yeah. So from here, uh, we pick up the purple orb. Um, we're going to head over to Aliahan to pick up the merchant and do the uh, new town quest. Um, Diener, uh, do you want to go ahead and explain that? I'm going to step away for a minute here. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, if you've been counting, keeping score at home, I said we need six colored orbs, and we just picked up the purple one there. That makes five out of six. And now we just need the last one. It's the yellow orb. Uh, the yellow orb is going to be the ultimate end prize uh, for the, the player-made town. So that's what the dealer is for. Uh, we're going to need the merchant character in order to progress this, this event forward. There are some other hidden flags that are required to get the town to progress all the way forward. And that's why we've done things in the sequence that we have. We've checked all of those boxes before even bothering with this part. And that's why we are going ahead and doing this. So we need to make room for the merchant. We're going to put away the... Oops, I menued it. It'll be too soon. Uh, I have to confirm I do want to put him in. Say no. Add dealer. Okay. So the dealer is level one and will probably get killed by anything that looks at her. Um, so we're going to tiptoe and we're going to fly to Portoga and we're going to pray that we sail to the newfound town without any monsters showing up. And if we don't get a fight, then that's great. Everything's just perfect and we'll pour it as planned. If there is monsters, I have to scramble a little bit. But hey, look at that. We made it. No problem. All right. So we're going to drop the merchant off. And I'm going to, like I said, to get this town to build and get my yellow orb, there's a specific set of triggers that I want to do in a specific order. So I'm going to drop off the merchant and then talk to the old man a second time. I'm going to leave the town, step on the boat, and come back inside. Talk to the merchant. Says she wants to build a shop here. And then we're going to do Dragon Quest Builder speedrun. The town's going to grow three times as I walk in and out of it. Tiptoe expiring. The town grows in three stages, and there are three specific triggers that 
uh, need to be uh, hit in order the town to fully build. It'll go up one stage for each one that's fulfilled. I believe it's recovering the blue orb as one, defeating Orochi and getting the purple orb as one, and defeating the boss troll, I believe, as one. But like I said, we've done everything else first. Now all we have to do is flip it to nighttime for the last trigger. Walk Yo, P-Town rocks with a raid. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And walk out and back in one more time, and then everything's complete. We should be able to pick up our yellow orb and catch the bird. Um, if you optionally, um, if you choose to go down around the lake instead of up around the lake, you can actually catch the uh, merchants uh, sitting in jail. Um, if you talk to people during this portion of the game, um, you find out that the merchant turned into a bit of a tyrant. Uh, and so they decided to build a prison and throw her into it. Uh, they weren't uh, happy with how she was making decisions. But from the but, sounds of it, it all seems like it's all going to work out in the end. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we get uh, we get an orb for our troubles. And now that we have collected all six of our orbs, um, we're going to go here. We're going to do a little uh, bag tidy. That was what uh, Diener did in the menu there. We put all uh, non-important items in the bag. Uh, and then we sort the bag by alphabet, and so all the orbs are in the same place, and we just put them on the pedestal one by one. Once we put them all on the pedestal, um, we're going to go talk to these twins who are going to say something, blah, 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 legend, blah, 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 collect the orbs, blah, blah, blah. And then this bird is going to hatch, and we're going to get about a minute from the time Break that time. we talk to them. Yep, we from the time that we talk to these uh, little girls to... Uh, the time that the bird flies off the screen is almost exactly one minute, and this is basically your one stretch break or bathroom break uh, in the run. Um, however, uh, we are close to the, uh, relatively speaking, we're close to the end of the run. Um, we're in the latter third. Um, basically, from here, uh, we're going to do a little bit of preparation for Baramos. We're going to go fight Baramos, and then we're going to do the Dark World. Uh, so from here, we're looking at, I would say, about an hour and change uh, to the end of the run. This is a cutscene that I've actually only seen a handful of times, because usually I just get up and walk around. Uh, it's very rare to actually sit down and watch this. Yeah, the Dark World goes fairly fast. Um... On average, uh, from the time you kill Baramos to the time you enter Soma's castle, I want to say is about 20 minutes. Um, uh, of course, because uh, you gotta you gotta gather up all the quest items, just like you're playing Dragon Quest One. You need the Stones of Sunlight, the Silver Harp. Well, actually, you don't get the Harp; you just get the Staff of Rain directly, and you get the Holy Talisman, which later becomes Erdrich's token, um, as well as um, pieces and money needed for the Sword of Kings, uh, which will eventually become Erdrich's sword. So there's some items to fetch in the World of Darkness before going to Soma's castle, but uh, for the most part, the rest of this run is pretty tidy. Um, here, we're going to be doing a little bit of inventory management. Um, we're going to use, so that strength seed that I think was held over from the lovely memories, uh, is going to go to the hero. And then we had some speed seeds that we gave to the sage. Um, we're going to throw some items in the sage's inventory, which again is the item that we put in the sage's inventory doesn't matter. It's not crucial what item it is. It's just a placeholder item. The inventory management op optimization in this game is actually kind of wild. Um, you kind of look at a, you're setting up inventory now for a setup later to put items exactly where you want them. It's, it's kind of insane. Um, but for right now, we're taking this bird over. Um, we could have optionally gotten this when we were uh, going to use the lovely memories. Um, that's just north of where we are now. Um, but it's a little bit quicker to wait until you get the bird to pick up the Sekaiju no Ha, or Leaf of the World Tree. Um, we are not going to learn Vivify or Revive at any point in the speed run. So the Leaf of the World Tree is the only way that we can revive a dead character. Um, so it's obviously extremely important. We hope that we never need to use these things, but if we need to use these things, we're going to be awfully glad we have them. 
All right, we've also come here to the Dragon Queen's Castle. She's going to give us an important quest item, maybe, sort of. The Orb of Light. What this is for? Well, we'll see that later. Now we're going to hold on to it. Now we're pretty much all set for uh, what we set out to accomplish in the beginning. To go fight Baramos. Yep, uh, we deposited the pure warrior into the friend bank at Rita's Tavern so that we could pick up the merchant. So we do need we do need to get that warrior back. Uh, so we're gonna stop off here. Um, optionally, uh, you can save at this. Oh, nun I'm here. glad I see this Kusanagi sword in here. I almost oh, did not get this. Yeah, wow, that really uh, did not. Huh. Happen. Yeah, that that would have been a little bit painful if that was still sitting in the bag. Yeah, that would have been. Uh, the sleep stabs are the, yeah, the stabs That's are That's what too. I was looking for. Um, so we're handing out, um, two sleep stabs and a Mifuji staff. The Mifuji staff, we never really explained. Uh, we picked that up, uh, uh, about an hour and a half ago. Um, the Mifuji staff is free stop spell, so we're gonna give that to the pure warrior along with a sleep staff. Um, we also gave a sleep staff to the sage. Uh, and, uh... Those stabs are going to be incredibly important for the rest of the run, but especially for Baramos. Um, yeah, I'm going right? to be... I th I th with how complex that fight is, I think now would be a good time to start talking about mm -hmm. it. I was just about to say the same thing. Uh, hopefully, between the encounter cancels and tiptoe, Baramos' castle will, hopefully, be pretty empty. Uh, we don't have to fight too many monsters. There's a small set of treasures that I'm going to go and uh, grab. That are going to be useful. A powerful weapon, um, the genie axe for the the pure warrior, uh, an extra prayer ring, and a helmet. It's a cursed helmet that we're going to give to the hero called the misery helmet. It's cursed, but it offers high defense power, and its curse is just that it reduces the wearer's luck stat to zero. And uh, we don't we don't care about the luck stat very much, so. Uh, it's actually just going to be a good defense power boost. Uh, so Baramos is going to be a pretty powerful enemy, and straight up at the start of the fight, he's way too strong for us to fight, like, toe-to-toe. -to -toe. We're going to break the fight up into two general phases. The first phase is really kind of a setup, where we're focusing on debilitating Baramos by lowering his attack power and defense power and accuracy and things like that. Then working on increasing our defenses with things like increase, increasing our attack power with by kill, and then lowering, yeah, lowering his defense power with sap. Once all of that's in place, then we're going to switch to an attack mode where we're we'll focusing on attacking, draining his HP as fast as possible. That's because Baramos is unknowns to most players. It's not showing you this. He's recovering about 100 missing hit points per turn. Meaning, if we fight him and we're not really doing a whole lot of damage, we're actually not accomplishing anything at all. The really important thing to getting this set up early on is going to be two effects. One, sleep. Yes, Baramos can fall asleep about 30% of the time, and everyone in my party has a way of putting him to sleep. And two is stop spell. He has extremely powerful magic, and once we stop spell him, we're going to take away his most powerful actions. The other important thing to know for me is that Baramos' actions that he takes are in a scripted pattern of actions, and I can more or less predict what he's going to do. So I'm going to pay very close attention to what's going on. Things are going to go pretty quickly, and... Uh... I'll do my best to uh, give a play-by-play -play here. So we're going to open up with the Iron Eyes spell. Iron Eyes is a spell that probably was not used much casually. Um, it turns your party to iron and makes you invulnerable to any form of attack, but you also can't fight back. But we are going to use it extensively in this fight because, again, we know Baramos' actions in advance, and based on what he does while we're Iron Eyes, uh, we may choose to use it again or not. However, the setup phase is going really well. We did get Baramos to sleep, and we did get um, his spell. He, his spells are, st are blocked, and he's still asleep, so he could take up to two actions per turn. He will most likely wake up on this next turn, um, but the longer he stays asleep, the better it is for us. He went right back. Oh my god, this, this, this setup is going really, really well. Um, we're keeping him asleep, and we're using increase to buff up our defense as much as we possibly can. Um, with defense and with uh, our defense raised, we're gonna go ahead and get Manusa or Surround in there. That also worked. Um, 
From there, uh, we're using Bi Kill to increase our party members' attack power. We're using Sap to lower Baramos' defense. Everything has pretty much hit bang on so far. Baramos should wake up this turn he did. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and try to get him back to sleep. He didn't quite go back to sleep. Um, <clears throat> so Diener's is going to throw out, he's going to have everybody throw sleeps out here. We're, we're, so again, this is where it's important to pay attention to where we are in his attack pattern. Baramos is going to breathe fire on his next attack, guaranteed. And so by knowing that, yeah. It's not going to work, so, but... One 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 option we can one thing we can do to try to get around that is again use that ironized spell. And we were hoping to see him do his breath attack as the last action, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So instead what we're gonna do is we're just gonna have everybody defend uh just to get past this attack. We know now his next two actions are gonna be to use the um limbo spell, which he casts even though it stops spell. The limbo spell does nothing. From there, um, his next two possible actions are physical attack into flame breath. He's not guaranteed to flame breath on this next turn, but it is a possibility. And that is unfortunately going to be a dead mage warrior for sure. So again, that's where picking up that world tree leaf is incredibly important. Um, even though our setup went really well, um, if Baramos keeps taking multiple turns and multiple actions per turn as he's doing, uh, even when your setup goes well, this fight can change on a dime. Um, we really, really need Baramos to go back to sleep. Oh, this, oh boy. Went to sleep a ton to set up, and he hasn't fallen asleep once since. Okay. This is looking pretty bad. I'm gonna kind of hail Mary. Well. Yeah, there's really not... Well, we got the sleep. Uh, he's still asleep, so there is potential to recover here. Um, this is not the most ideal situation because one thing about Baramos, Baramos gives the most experience of any enemy in the game. Baramos gives more experience than... Wow, that dodge was uh, pretty clutch. Um, Baramos gives the most experience of any enemy in the game. Um, all of our characters are going to get a ton of levels, and with those levels, they're going to get a ton of hit points. And so... If Diener can clear this fight, that's great. Um, it will be a little bit unfortunate, though, that uh, the Mage Warrior will be uh, missing some experience. Um, that said, if Diener does recover the fight, uh, that's incredible. This is um, going to be a Baramos kill for the, oh, for the man. ages if we can hang, if we can somehow he's, pull this one off. Well, he's he's going to sleep, but now that we're out of the setup, he's not staying asleep, and we kind of need him to stay asleep. Because again, he is he is getting that region. Wow, these misses uh, are so ridiculously clutch. Um, okay, now I'm in oh massive boy. trouble. Yeah, Baramos is not asleep, and Breath is coming up. This might be checkmate, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna try it. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna do it. So unfortunately, that's <clears throat> that's how the Baramos fight can yep. just go. Um, um, I never actually saved my game, and oh I no. just reset it. Oh no! Oh, oh no! Oh, hold. Okay. Uh. Uh. Uh oh. So we just reset back to before we got by kill. Unfortunately, uh, uh, ideally uh, we get. <laughs> ideally we would have saved in Aliahan and reset there. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Um. <laughs> Alrighty, part two of the run. Part two. This is well. Wow, this uh, is. This is a major blow. I Okay. Yeah, this is unfortunate, but uh Evil Ass <laughs> has given us the green light to keep going, so we're gonna keep going. Uh so yeah. Uh so uh for those of you who came in from the raid, uh you're going to uh get to see some of the run that you didn't get to see before. Hey, by kill first strike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing so hard. Oh my goodness. Uh, I thought it was I... bad. I thought it was bad last marathon when I like 
miscounted my XP and had to go to level 22. This is way, way worse. Yeah, it's a little unfortunate that <laughs> sets us back probably about, yeah, we were at 135. About 45 we minutes, before. yeah. Yeah, about 45 pretty, minutes, so. Pretty good. That's all right. Oh. Hopefully, uh, the Orochi will go better this time around, at least. So yeah, uh, for anyone who, uh, for the raiders who came in uh, a little bit later, um, you are going to get to see a portion of the run that you didn't get to see before. Well, I tell um, you who's not going to hit estimate. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, all I can say is... is, yeah, no, you're right. I didn't. I didn't save it. I made the stabs and I went right to it. And I... You know, that's an optional save, and a lot of people will just take the death and recover using the World Tree Leaves, which is what I should have done, probably. It's already toast. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, you walk over to the nun and you just assume that you saved, and uh, sometimes uh, you just forget. Uh, but it's okay. Staring right at her. Oh, well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so we're going to be, uh, redoing, uh, a couple of things that, we, uh, some story stuff that we did before. So, uh, here, we're in the town of Lancel. Uh, the town of Lancel is host to a cave called the Navel of Earth. And in here, we're going to be picking up some gear. Um, specifically, we're going to pick up the Terra Firma armor, as well as the blue orb. Oh, I'm mismenuing. Oh, well. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Bad Defending defense. here instead of running uh, means that you're just guaranteed to get attacked a bunch of times. Yeah. Oops. Not a, not a big deal, though. The Sage's HP is incredibly high, and so the odds of her dying in this cave, I actually have never seen it happen. So I've been killed once. Um, it's very interesting because you just wake up right by the, the priest in Lancel, and you can just talk to him and walk right back in. It's almost no time. Oh, interesting. There there are times where I have come close to dying. These uh, apes on the left can crit. Mm, uh, I want to say there you. are some like rogue knights that can crit, like some random enemies. But aside from enemies that can crit, you're not taking a whole lot of damage here. All right. Well, we're just going to have to uh, do a lot better on all these parts this time. Right? We're going to fly, fly through much quicker. Wink. Yeah, uh, uh, Orochi is going to be super clean. I have every confidence that all of the other very talented runners in the marathon will go ahead of Estimate. We'll get caught right back up on schedule in no time. Now we've already had one PB in this run. <laughs> or this marathon, rather. <laughs> Tell you who's not going to be. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Things that things happen from time yeah, to time yeah. in marathons. You're trying to think about a lot of things at once, and uh, sometimes things fall through the cracks. But it's okay. It's okay. Uh, yeah. no, I'm not worried about it. But like I said, uh, you know, we're probably going to go a little bit overestimate, but uh, that's totally fine. Um, as long as uh, things go fairly stable from here on out, it shouldn't be uh, too uh, too bad. Wow, that's pretty quick rare. too. Well, this is at least an interesting opportunity to actually highlight how different these runs can actually be. Play this game. Um, we're gonna pick up from the same second half spot. Ooh, there's a second fight. Wow, this is really something. Um, but certain parts of the game are probably gonna go better or worse, and you're gonna see kind of. Maybe some slightly different strategies or approaches out of me. Did I use Snowstorm again? Worked okay. Pretty similar to what we did last time. I'm just going to grab these monsters just to grab the... Well, not for me, but the six level ups here. So... Getting them now is fine, but Bostrel and getting them after Bostrel is just as fine. I'll just a little em. bit of extra safety, just in case you get that encounter walking to Saminosa. It's nice to have a little bit extra HP on your Mage Warrior. That's true, too.
All right. Uh... So this conveniently placed shrine here. Um, uh, in earlier in the run, um, we were doing some level grinding and. Uh, experience is split among characters that are living at the time that the battle ends. So, um, over the course of the Metal Slime grind, we kill off the hero and the pure warrior as experience on them is not as important as experiences on the sage and the mage warrior. And we can conveniently revive them here um, before heading off to uh, the uh, town of Tadon. Uh, and uh, we're also going to go ahead and that uh, terra firma armor that we picked up uh, in the navel of the earth uh, is going to go to the warrior. It's a nice piece of gear that is he's only going to wear pretty much for the boss troll fight, and then we're going to sell it for money. Yep. Lots and lots of money. Now, I'll try to, this time around, maybe highlight some of the subtle things as they come up. If I, if I can see any opportunities. I maybe provide a little additional insight. We were sort of talking a little bit about uh, some inventory management and things like that. And what Lapkin was talking about is absolutely right. There's a lot of instances where I'm really trying to keep track of where everything is in my bag. And there are some very particular item movements that I'll make that are not necessarily like strictly required, but they're more designed to push items around in certain places or get things in a consistent uh, 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 pattern. One of the things I'm very particular about, especially with this setup, is how Sage's items are all arranged in her bag as we get towards the end of the game mentioning about how I was just taking some random item out of my bag and giving it to the sage. Yeah, it's kind of just to swap a couple items around and have this placeholder item. Uh, I end up using a moth powder, which does occasionally have its uses at the yes, very end does. of the game. So that's yes. why I choose that item to stick in there. But if I don't have any moth powder left, it's just as easy to give her a club or something. It's just something to stick in Tori. Okay. Um, obviously, the text is in Japanese, and while I can kind of read the phonetics, the hiragana and the katakana that are on the screen, it's always going to be faster and easier for me to access things if I just know where they are. I don't have to read anything at all, right? It doesn't matter that if it's in English or not. I know that if I press this button, I get to this item. Yeah, one example is something we're seeing, we just saw right here. So uh, Diener went into the Sage's inventory to use the uh, Lamp of Darkness. Um, the Sage is the first character in the party, the first character in the party slot right now. And the Lamp of Darkness is the first item in her inventory. And so all you got to do is go to item and then you can just hold the turbo button and it will go straight there. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the things that we're kind of talking about uh, for, for like item layouts um, in combat, um, one of, we do a little setup trick to make sure that when we pick up sleep staves, uh, the sleep staff is going to be the first item in the mage's inventory, uh, such that if we need to put sleep on something, um, you just go to the item menu and you can just hold X from there and you know that that first item is going to be uh, that sleep staff. Um, and then, yeah, Dieter was talking about the sage. The sage in particular, when we get to the dark world, the sage is going to have a ton of options for things that she can do. Um, we're going to pick up a sage's staff later on, which is a free heal more in combat. Um, and then she's going to have that sleep staff and the uh, mist staff for free sleep and stop spell casts. And so you've got three different items that cast three different spells for free. And if you know exactly where they are in the inventory and you keep them in the same spot in the inventory every time, just like Diener said, you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to read like, oh, this is where the, the sage staff is. Oh, this is where the mist staff is. You just know, okay, I press A, right A, and I'm going to use the sleep staff. Or I press A and up and I'm going to use the um, mist staff. Those are things that we are thinking about. Um, as we're setting up our inventory. Um, but that's going to be um, important about an hour or so from now. Um, here, what we're doing in the town of Samanosa is we're doing, we're buying some gear, doing a little bit of preparation for the boss troll fight. 
Um, we're selling some old gear that's not uh, that we're not using right now, as well as some expensive items that we picked up. We're going to buy a zombie killer, which is a sword that's going to go to the warrior. And we're going to buy dragon shields, which are going to go to both of the warriors and the hero. Um, these shields are incredibly important as they mitigate breath damage. And those of you who were, you know, here for the first time we went through this, uh, know that we're going we to be cooked. seeing a lot of... We're going we're, we're gonna to be seeing a lot of breath attacks, not out of Boss Troll, but out of Orochi and out of uh, Theramos and uh, Bosses. Uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's a little less hot than last time. It can't very well be a lot hotter than last time. We... I... <laughs> Three I doubles, it. and all of those were strong breath attacks. Uh, yeah, if we see that again, uh, there's something wrong with your cart. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, yep, setting up here for boss troll. Same basic deal. I'm going to do a little bit of a party reorder. As we saw earlier... Um, those early turns are where it's going to be dangerous, and I want those front characters defending. If the boss troll does crit me, it's more likely to be on somebody in the front. So I'm going to put my defending characters up in the front, and uh, hopefully we won't get bopped. This should hopefully go smoothly, like last time. Let's see what goes on. So we're going to open with some stop spells to steal, seal his ability to lower my defense power and start building my own up. Yeah, boss troll is fairly boss troll is fast enough that uh, he pretty much always gets this uh, defense spell off before he can be stop spelled. But he's fairly susceptible to stop spell, so yeah, we've already stopped his ability to cast spells. And so yeah, so the maid, the sorry, the warrior and the hero in the first two slots, they are defending um, because again, boss troll can crit. Uh, if boss troll does end up critting, we want him to crit one of the first party members. Um, but now that we've got our defense buffed up. Uh, Diener is going to cast a buy kill on Boss Troll himself, and you might think, wait, why do we want to increase Boss Troll's attack power? Well, the reason for that is that buy kill has this hidden effect where, ooh, first try sap, that's right. awesome. Um, buy kill has an effect where uh, anything, any, a party member or enemy under the influence of buy kill cannot critically strike. And so now that we've got our defense pretty much maxed out, um, we can take, it's it's 0 to 40 is the damage that we can take here. And it's really, for whatever reason, tends to wait towards the single digit end. Uh, and so now that we've got our setup more or less complete, uh, we're just going to cast by kill and increase everybody's uh, attack power and hold X and win. Yep, at this point, uh, Sap hit first try, which is very lucky. Uh, buy kills are in place, so he's going to be disappearing very shortly. D Diener, this was just advanced RNG manipulation, right? Highly advanced. Highly so advanced. So we're somehow going to warp from Bostril to Zomas and be strong enough to beat him. <laughs> I mean, Zoma, yeah, so what's the, Zoma? Uh, Baramos. As long as you don't get crit within the first couple of rounds of boss troll, it usually goes pretty smoothly. All right, that went totally smoothly. Ah, uh, that's the wrong town. I haven't been. Oops. How about uh, first try staff to change instead of eighth try? Remember to use the strength seed this time too. Okay. Yep, uh, we're gonna do this part again where I've got to uh, buy some important things at this elf town. Uh, the elf merchant will not sell to humans or scary monsters, but dwarves and cute monsters are okay. Uh, Diener, I'm going to take the opportunity, since we're doing this again, to... I, I meant to ask this before and forgot. Uh, this is a little bit of uh, inside baseball. You want to talk about the nuances of the run. I've noticed some Japanese runners tend to skip no annuals entirely and just return to Kazav. Is that something you've ever... Have you noticed that? Is that something you've ever considered incorporating oh, into your routing? No, I haven't actually seen that. Um... Because you you really only use the no annuals return point to get to the Olivia's Cape faster. Uh, and so I've seen Japanese runners opt to just walk up from Kazav and skip no annuals entirely. 
Um, I don't know if that's just if that's in because the 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 chart that Japanese players uh, run when they play this game uh, is very 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 subtly different uh, from the chart that we run. The major points are the same. The order that things are done in is a little bit different in the specific mm -hmm. section. It's my understanding um, that floating around the community, there's two different two different charts. Yeah. And they're very, very similar, and it's kind of like you see subtle differences. Um, one of the things I always noticed was um, uh, Popson, when we would race, he routes the stuff after um, after you get the boat. He goes to Edinburgh first, and then he goes to the pirate hideout and Dharma. And whereas I always go to pirate hideout and, and Dharma, and then do Edinburgh. I thought about it, and I was like, there's no reason to do one or the other. It's exactly identical. Yeah, um, in terms of time and efficiency, they're pretty much the same. It's and just, I couldn't uh, even figure out a way of like, oh, this one saves you menu input somehow. I was like, no, they're like <laughs> identical. No matter what. <laughs> Completely identical. Oh, yeah, doing Edinburgh first in case you get friend banks does kind of make sense. Because uh, then you can go to, since you're going back to Aliahan anyway. I guess. You could just pop right in there. Yeah, I had, I had never taken the time to think about it. I can see that it's one in a thousand runs that you get the uh, limbo from the birds uh, that you can encounter on the way up to Enver. Uh, I suppose if that does happen, uh, it's a little bit more efficient not to have to go to Iliahan twice. But yeah, here uh, we gave the staff a change to the old man in exchange yep. for the sailor's bone. The Sailor's Bone is an item required to make. There's a ghost ship that we're about to board. That ghost ship will not spawn unless we have the Sailor's Bone. The Sailor's Bone also, if you use it as an item... Uh, it helps point you, you in the location. direction of where it yeah. is supposed to be. But I'm pretty sure when it spawns, it always appears right in that spot. And then starts meandering from there. So if you just go directly from Bone to Romilly, it's going to be so close by that you can't miss it. Yeah, it's it's got a an interesting kind of box that it can spawn in because sometimes it's a little bit closer to Romilly and sometimes it's a little bit further away. Yeah, but it for the most part it's around. It, yeah, for the most part it's always directly southeast of Romilly and directly southeast of that tiny island uh, that you have to maneuver around. Yeah, it's pretty consistently right over there. Um... I was gonna say, I was cutting no annuals. I was like, well, there is a chart where I was cutting no annuals. My short lived elf cut route. Oh, yeah, you and Pop were working on that for a while. It's not bad, but fighting Baramos without those sleep stabs is. Uh, well, and also you less just. Less uh, consistent. You, keeping your uh, prayer ring count in the dark world also is a little bit dicey. I know that you can uh, potentially pick up the one in uh, Mountain Cave, but I don't think the, you're going to be the going trade off, there. The trade-off that I figured, it's a King Sword cut route that ends up with a Sage's Staff, so you're not quite as dependent on the Prayer Rings for MP. You can still keep I going see. if you bust them. So that was kind of the logic of cutting two Prayer Rings and the Sleep Staves in exchange for a Sage's Staff at Endgame. Which... I actually started doing a lot of Dark World King Sword cut practice, and it's sort of more normal. Like when I first started practicing, I was getting horrible prayer ring. I just couldn't couldn't seem to figure out what was going on with that. But I yeah. used I used the Sage's staff. I call it a crutch. Yeah, I was leaning on that. <laughs> like it's called King Sword cut, but you use the Sage's staff too, and it's like, oh yeah, that I feel that. Yeah, it's it's brutal when you not having access to free heal more in the dark world. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't seem that significant because you can just cast it. But a big part of that is actually learning and really mastering that spell book menu, and it's a lot harder than the item menu. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. There, because there, of the because there's so memory. much nuance. Well, the cursor memory, but also like the random spells that you that's learn the that you other never thing think too, about otherwise. It's... The yeah, inputs the, can you, be different depending on what spells you yep. do or don't have. It's it's wild. And if you you know happen to learn a spell along the way, it might change that menuing in the middle of the run. Metal babble, and suddenly you have extra spells you're not yeah. used to having. It's 
There's a lot of interesting things I can add, but... I no. have never, never once have I ever lost a Dragon Warrior randomizer race to learning Hurt Lord in an opportune time. <laughs> Alright, back to Mount Dorito. Getting hungry yet? Um, yep, this, uh, this run's sponsored by Frito-Lay. Um, next... Yeah, we're gonna go through this Necroground section again. Um, hopefully it'll be pretty similar, nice and nice and smooth, low encounter rate. But yeah, no, we won't be doing any fancy, dangerous stuff at the end of the game. Although, maybe I should, to save some time, get caught back up on the... Oh no, never mind, never getting caught back up. <laughs> King sorry cut in a marathon to make estimate, sounds standard. <laughs> no, I'm still not even close. <laughs> It doesn't save that much time. I'm getting a walk. Can I get daytime? Yes. Wow. Wow. This That's might be the zero encounter overworld. That is an this incredible walk. It's very rare. But the spots in which I want to use the darkness lamp are very meticulously like planned out. There's a very specific reason why we pick certain spots that we... Um, and it's hoping that it works out like that. And it's the same for uh, whenever Diener is going into the menu uh, to cast uh, Shinobiashi or uh, Tiptoe. Uh, that's also uh, kind of uh, planned out in advance mm -hmm. uh, because there is a text box that will pop up to let you know when Tiptoe has uh, run out. And so ideally, we're going to be using Tiptoe in such a way that we minimize the amount of times we cast Tiptoe while also minimizing the amount of times we see that text box pop up. I mean, it's frames. We're talking about frames here, but obviously you want to save as many as you can. So Yeah, every time Tiptoe wears off and I, that message box pops up, it's about like one and a half seconds, two seconds maybe. But if you think about it, if you're if you're missing it every single time, then that's going to add up to 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 the run. Absolutely. And we don't want to spend and, that time. And it's also it's just one of those things where as you practice the second second half of the run, it's something you don't even really need to think about. Um, you'll just get to the point where you're like, okay, I cast it here, I cast it here, I cast it here. You know, you just mm -hmm. kind of have a sense of it's not an exact tile thing. There's no step route to this game. Um, but you general you have a general idea of where tiptoe is about to run out, and you just cast it before then. Yeah, it's it's one of these things that like if you're playing it, it kind of like teaches itself because you walk around and expires, and you see where you're standing, and you go, oh, okay, I need to cast it just before this spot right. Here. And then if you miss one, which I guarantee you happens to everyone all the time, it still happens to me all the time, at least two or three times a run, I miss it. It reminds you, and then immediately you use it again, and you're right back on, you know, right on your beat, right? You haven't, like, you know, you're not out of sync anyway. Right. Since the spell costs no MP, you're not really punished for casting it a whole bunch of times or using it again just to get it back to where you're used to. Things like that. That's oh. also one thing where practicing the King Sword cut is important because you're, um, Tiptoe casts are going to be in different places because of different routing. Oops. I'm there, but... It's that fight. I thought I cast Tiptoe. I gotta fight. That's honestly what causes me to forget most of the time. I'm about to cast it, and it's a battle, and I get out of the battle, and I... So here this old man gives us the uh, silver orb, uh, one of the orbs that we need to pick up the godbird Ramia. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to head over to Jipang and fight Yamato no Orochi again, who will hopefully be less painful. Can't easily be more painful. So... <laughs> and we'll remember to uh, put the Kusanagi sword on the warrior. Hey, let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> You think I actually um, am decent at this game? What? <laughs> it was uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier uh, in the NES version of this game. Um, some routes come here to fight uh, metal slimes. They can appear here, 
Um, a lot of the time, you get here with maybe one, maybe two encounters. Uh, and sometimes the Metal Slimes can pop up. But we've killed all the Metal Slimes that we want to kill now. Eight Metal Slimes is just going to be a waste of time for us. In fact, yeah, I will probably, if they did show up, I'd probably try to run away from them. It's not worth trying to scratch at them with the weapons that can hurt them. I'll spend more time killing one Metal Slime than actually be worth it. Okay, let's see how this fight goes this time. Open surround nest. Kaishin no Ichigeki. The first crit I've scored. That is actually the first crit that I've seen this entire run. So, uh, the manip is working. Surround isn't. Yeah, <laughs> Baramos used the uh, the sands of time. That's what happened. Playing this a little slowly. Some of my things haven't worked. It's getting a little bit interesting. It's a relatively uh, clean start. Uh, the only thing that's unfortunate is that, yeah, uh, surround missed. Um, ideally, we would have surround up so that Orochi would be missing more of these physical attacks, uh, but uh, at this point, it's just faster. We've got all of our buy kills in place. We've got, we've got our um, attack power maxed out across the board, so we're just going to go ahead and cast Sap and uh, punch Orochi down. Those critical medical herbs still sitting in her bag. Still fresh. Yep. We uh, we pile some uh, medical herbs into the Mage Warrior's inventory. Mage Warrior is the last character in our party right now. Uh, we do that for uh, Boss Troll, and then uh, those the herbs are still sticking around and still useful uh, sometimes for the Orochi one fight. So, yep, that you, having uh, Surround miss twice is unfortunate. Um, that fight went a little bit slower than it might normally would have, but... At least we didn't have anybody die. <laughs> I was gonna say, at least we didn't die. Okay, okay that looks good. Just double check my MP, I should have plenty. We want, ideally, we want at least 40 on the hmm. Sage to have enough for increase, sap, and, uh, and heal more throughout plenty, the fight. Plenty of heals for the fight, yeah. Sometimes we don't need that much, but... Kind of pushing it if you don't have that much. Most things clicking here to start. Making some damage from these breath attacks, but that's nothing I can't handle just yet. Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, this doesn't apply to a lot of bosses in this run, but with the way that Diener is set up right now, he knows that uh, he's, he's got a, a safe HP range. Uh, any character that is above 60 hit points is going to be completely safe that round, so they don't necessarily need to be healed. Um, anyone that's below 60 hit points, um, Dino might want to have them defend. Uh, but in this case, the only character below 60 was the warrior, and because we have the meteorite armband on the sage, we know that the sage is going to always act first. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say always. 99% of the time... This age is going to act first. Um, there is a weird, uh, I guess we have an opportunity to talk a little bit more inside baseball type stuff. My understanding is that at the start of a round of combat, the game applies a modifier of 30 agility uh, or up to 30 agility, um, which is one of the reasons why the warrior or why Baramos Ganis can sometimes go before other characters despite having zero agility. Is that correct? Um, I think what the game does is that it takes everybody's agility. It adds some value. Maybe it's 30 or maybe it's 20, something like that. Um, just so that they're all not zero. And it multiplies everybody's value by a random value between, I think, 0 and 2. And then from there, sorts everybody. Uh, 
uh, from highest to lowest, which means anybody, no matter how high their agility is, can get hit by that zero multiplier and go dead last. Even your fastest characters can go slower than the slowest thing. In I did not know about that multiplier. That actually explains a lot of some of the weird things I've seen. I've also never gotten gone to this pot. What was in that pot? Oh, that's a string seed. Oh, that is a string seed I've never seen before. Yeah, I've I started adding that one recently. I've never really seen anybody else get that one very often, but I was like, oh, it's uh, no more out of the way than some of the other ones I get, so just add it in there. It ends I, up tidying I've... into the bag and is easy to use when I go to get Ramya. Yeah, that makes sense. I've noticed that uh, the one seed that is in um, most uh, route guides that always gets skipped is that life nut in the well over by Norid. <laughs> I used Even... to get that one a long time yep. ago. Yeah, and I'm yep. done with that one. Every, everyone gets it at the start, and it's the first seed that gets cut. <laughs> it's always the first seed that gets cut, because it is kind of it is kind of out of the it way. Is, it is quite a bit out of the way. You have to go all the way down there and go down to the tile and go back up, and it's like, I don't know, 20 seconds, but at a certain point, you just don't want to waste that time on unlike, six Unlike HP. things like the Strength Seeds, too, yes. where you're getting immediate value out of them and have a lot of power early on in the game, the Life Force Nuts do not... Oh, uh-oh. Wait. It's a lot of guys. All right, we're going to play... Uh... Uh, hang on. Oh, are we going to do Return in Combat? Okay. Yeah, so with fail. our uh, with our merchant at level one, uh, any fight that we get on the way to Newtown uh, is incredibly dangerous. Uh, so Deander just opted to use the return spell, which gets you out of combat for free. And just yeah, failing back. to I run away is likely going to result in her death, and reviving her is slower than just kind of just hitting the the ball again. Does that just take you back to the last place you saved at, or how does? Uh, I think it always takes you to Aliahan. Oh, I see. All right. Once again, we'll have to do the Dragon Quest Builder speed run. Doesn't take too long. I'd I mean, actually never looked up what the uh, specific flags were for this uh, portion of the. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier, and unless I'm mistaken, uh, there are three different ones. One is getting the blue, one is getting the purple orb from Yamato no Orochi, and one is to defeat the boss troll. So, if you've done all those three things, and you come here, then you can just build up the town really it's one of several reasons why it's routed this way, but if you also notice, we pick up that silver orb kind of in the middle. That's the one that, casually, you're probably going to collect last. There's the most number of steps, and the enemies along the way are the most powerful. But we take advantage of the fact that there's the Thunder Sword and the Blade Armor hidden there. We want to acquire those quickly so that we can use their power against uh, Yamato no Chi. All right, now once again, we're basically back to where we. Were. Second time I blanked on where to go there. Oh well. Okay. So yeah, now we're gonna uh, go up here to the Shrine of Ramia. We're gonna put down the six orbs that we have diligently collected over the course of the run. And uh, the first stretch break of the run, right? Mm-hmm. And hey, all we had left is to defeat Baramos, and with a 330 estimate, oh, we're gonna finish way faster than oh, that. Oh yeah, we're, we're almost done with this game. <laughs> so we were we were asked by the uh, by the king of Aliahan to go beat up Baramos. Uh, there was something about trying to find our father, but that doesn't matter. We'll see. Okay. Um, there, that's all taken care of again. Uh, that's a convenient kind of thing there that we can tidy the bag and then sort everything by type and just plop all the orbs in sequence there. It doesn't matter which orb goes in which pedestal, it's just uh, to get them in there whatever way you can.
All right. Catch the godbird again. <laughs> oh. Just thinking about how we got here. It's been a interesting ride, that is for certain. If not for one silly mistake. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we would uh on a average run we'd probably be at or through Zoma. Uh, well, around considering this considering I would have had to fight Baramus again. Uh, I'd probably be in the castle. But Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Maybe the maybe the boss rest stretch in the altar, but yeah, with a clean dark world, I could see us being on the boss rush. All I'm seeing is that we're at around the end step. All right, that's cool. Hey, it's okay. We'll get through it. Hey, hey, target right now is finish under. Yes. It's pretty. So a little bit of that item management that we talked about before is going to happen here. Um, we're going to menu that uh, strength seed we got in Japan over to the hero and some speed seeds over to the sage. Because, again, we do want to maximize the sage's agility. Uh, we want that to be as high as possible. Um, and then we put a couple of placeholder items in the sage's inventory as talked about before. And now we will take advantage of having the bird... Uh, we return to Dharma and, and fly a little bit north uh, to a specific spot and pick up Sekaiju no Ha, or the World Tree Leaf. Um, again, we will not be learning Vivify, Revive, Zing, Kazing, Zauriku, none of those spells. We're not going to learn those at any point in this run. So that World Tree Leaf is going to be our only means of reviving. And yes, this bird... It's a bit notorious for refusing to land where you want it to. Um, this mode seven effect and the music that come along with it are gorgeous. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't always like to accept your inputs um, immediately. I, I suspect there's a little bit of lag involved in the mode seven effect there. Yeah, Rami is a bit stubborn sometimes, which is why you see I'm not exactly landing her precisely where I maybe would want, but... Yeah, we're in the ballpark, and as long as I don't accidentally try and land on the thing I'm trying to go into, then it's usually okay. Alright, this time, what are we going to do? We're going to save at the Nun. If that's your plan, then please do. We're either going to save or we're not going to reset or something. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we have to come back here to the friend bank. Um... Because we deposited our pure warrior to get the merchant in our party. And uh, here we're going to do a little bit of inventory management. We've got two sleep staffs that we want on our warriors. And the miss staff for free stop spell uh, is going to go to the pure warrior. Um, because we want a lot of spell casting options for that Baramos fight. And from here we're pretty much ready to go fight Baramos again. Um, just gotta get on the, uh, get on the bird here, and, uh, through a combination of techniques that we've talked about over the course of the run, um, we briefly glossed over it the first time that we were here, um, but, uh, through the combination of tiptoe and encounter canceling, um, ideally we're not gonna see any fights in Baramos's castle, um, if we're going to see a fight at all, so you're going to see uh, Diener is going to enter the castle here and he's going to go up and down these stairs. And what that's going to do is there's an invisible number that is ticking down every step towards the next encounter. And if you're going to see a fight, it's usually going to be that walk right there from the stairs to that door. That door also counts as a transition. All these stairs count as transitions. And that combined with the tiptoe cutting the encounter rate in half, uh, like uh, Diener said before, usually makes Paramos' castle pretty empty. Yeah, which is good because there's some pretty nasty, uh, nasty customers in 
While it's a little bit weaker by the time we get to Zoma, the evil mages use um, Blizzard, which does a ton of damage to my party right now, and they come in groups. They're fairly susceptible to expel. To expel, right? yes. Um, but if it doesn't work, Sage goes slow. Then can be in for a pretty bad time. Um, uh, in addition to things like Stone Men just wanting to step on you, uh, Snow Dragons are not easy to deal with. I usually that's one of the bonus reasons, honestly, like I why I like to um, when I actually remember to save the game. Save the game. Uh, I can opt to simply just try and run away from monsters in Baramos's castle if I run into them, and if they want to kill me, then it's super easy to just reset. It's very rare, but it is one of these like actual like tiny little things that can make it a little bit easier, a little more bearable. Okay, now we're getting set up for Baramos once again. As I was discussing before this fight, it's going to be broken up in two pieces, mostly because of how powerful he is and because he's regenerating health. Uh, I want to really focus on debilitating him again so he can't cast his powerful spells, lowering his accuracy, lowering his defense power, increasing my defense power and attack power, and then switching into a more offense mode. And, uh, oops. That's not what I Alright, let's go. Baramosu. So, Diener right now is going to be paying attention to what Baramos does while we are... Yes, he did remember to save. Um, but uh, we're going to be paying attention to Baramos's actions here while we're under the influence oh. of Iron Eyes. Um, we're going to be looking for a specific set of turns here. We got the... Okay, so we got the stop spell Oops. off. Uh, so that's going to reduce the, the types that's of actions that Baramos can take. Oh, boy. Okay, so uh, ideally we would have gotten Baramos to sleep or uh, not taken that uh, breath attack, but uh, that's where healing up is going to... Oh, boy. Wow, is, exact, exact damage on the exact target. Um, that is why we keep that uh, World Tree Leaf uh, for situations like this, so we can go ahead and bring back that Mage Warrior. Um, Baramos not staying asleep for the setup this time, unfortunately, but any given sleep can uh, allow us Four to misses. cruise through huh. the setup phase. Oh, boy. Astodon might be the... Okay, we can wow. defend, defend, sleep, defend. Um, this is one, this is really the point in the run where um, being able to read Japanese and being able to know whether or not a status effect has landed is absolutely critical. And really, with sleep, you're looking at the text box to see whether or not it worked, and you're looking at the text box to see whether or not he woke up. So right now, Baramos is asleep, and it is absolutely critical that you pay attention. So he just woke up. And you can see how fast those messages uh, went by. He went right back to sleep. And so not only are you paying... This is this is really the most complex fight in the entire game. Because not only are you paying attention to whether or not Baramos is asleep, you're paying attention to where you're at in your setup phase. How many increases have you cast? How many buy kills have you cast? Have you cast Surround or Sap yet? Um, that's all part of the setup phase. And then you're paying attention to whether or not Baramos is asleep and where he is in his turn order. Um, we saw that breath attack fairly recently. And so once uh, Diener is comfortable with the setup phase, we're going to be keeping an eye out on whether or not it's going to come up again. Uh, so right now we're pretty much through the setup phase. We've got all our stats boosted as high as they're going to go. Um, and so really we're just looking for a sleep message here. And yes, he did go to sleep. But I'll do it again. And so, yeah, we're going to go ahead and throw a buy kill on that Mage Warrior just to make sure that our attack power is absolutely at its maximum. Um, and Baramos is still sleeping, so this is the portion of the Baramos fight where we just kind of get to hold X. Um, maybe look for one more sleep out of the Sage. I forgot where on the turn order I was, and I played safely. I'm just going to go for damage. It's going to get a little tight, but I'm 
feel this confident is... that I've got this under control. Oh wow, that was very unfortunately oh my... timed. Oh my goodness, that was an incredibly unfortunate bit of RNG. Um, that Baramos decided to attack the warrior and go first. Uh... Uh... This is a situation where it, again, just like the first time we were here, if Diener can clear the fight, uh, potentially. Um, the really unfortunate thing, though, is that, uh, yeah, after Kiarimu, yeah, it's really unfortunate. I ran myself um, out of MP and into a corner, too. I'm not, I did not yeah. do this well. I beat him. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so we are through Baramos. The unfortunate thing is that the pure warrior is missing out on all of this experience, and uh, so the pure warrior is going to be missing a bunch of HP uh, for the Dark World, uh, which could make things dicey for Zoma, um, but uh, sometimes that's just how no reset runs go. Uh, we'll definitely be using all those life force nuts on the pure warrior when it comes time to do that. I like this party that, that managed to finish this. I've got everybody in yellow. I've got a grand total of 9 MP across four <laughs> char three characters. Four characters. Uh... I'll... I wouldn't say I played my best Baramos on either one. We're through it. That's what counts. It's true. Uh, and so now Baramos is dead, and the spirit of Rubus is going to talk to us. One funny thing about um, the remakes of Dragon Quest III, uh, in the NES version, uh, you do not have to go back to Aliahan immediately, uh, which is actually funny. It's... Uh, People that I know that play Dragon Warrior 3 randomizer take advantage of this fact because after you kill Baramos, the game expects you to go to Aliahan and it turns off all encounters. Mm -hmm. um, but you can actually uh, go to the Dark World uh, and run through the Dark World with no encounters uh, and actually finish the game that way in randomizer. But you don't have that option here. Um, Rubus heals your party back to full and forces you to uh, go to Aliahan where you get congratulated by all the townspeople. Sans, your mother could be and bothered. Looks like we did okay. Made oh it here yeah, to the end of the game. <laughs> three thirteen, three thirteen. Incredible time. I'm gonna walk up here and uh, talk to the king, and he says, "Hey, welcome back. You defeated Baramos. Good job." We get to kick back and enjoy the uh, celebration. Could possibly go wrong. So we're going to get some uh, mysterious rumbling and some thunderbolts are going to kill these level one trumpeters. Um, and then we're going to get this guy. I'm going to get this little cool animation here. My favorite part of this series of text boxes is that I believe there are nine total text boxes that pop up here. In the second box, um, Zoma says Waganawa, Waganawa Zoma, which literally means my name is Zoma. The second to last text box, he says, Waganawa Zoma, which means my name is Zoma. He really, really, really wants to make sure that you know that his name is, in fact, Zoma. He, says he, repeats, he repeats that twice, and two other of his dialogue boxes are him laughing at you, so. Wahahahaha. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, Zoma's not a nice guy. He is the king of evil. Baramos was the lord of evil. He's the king of got to go to his lair and uh, face him. He resides in the dark world. This land. Jump into this pit. Head off. To perhaps a familiar location. I've been paying close attention earlier in the marathon to some other Dragon Quest games. There should be some similarities. Yeah, if there's anything that you want to do when a giant crack in the earth opens, it's jump right into it immediately. Yeah. Um, so we're going to fall down here to this island. Uh, Diener just picked up a strength seed that was sitting on the ground. Um, again, we want the hero to be as strong as possible because when we get to the Zoma fights, um, the vast majority of our damage is going to be coming out of the hero. So every strength seed that you pick up uh, from the start of the game up to the very end of the game is going to pay off in... Uh, the amount of damage the hero is able to do in the Zoma fights. 
Rare pickup uh, for me here, but uh, with oh. the warrior being dead, I'm already thinking like any bit that I can maybe get to help him out might might be worth it. Yeah, that's an extra life. Back. That's an extra life now. I'm not getting the nor. No. I was gonna say <laughs> we we could pick up the stones of sunlight and go back to Ashlam. <laughs> Mm. We were we were just talking about that seed. <laughs> it's not worth the two HP for me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Life Force nuts roll two to six, and uh, we are going to be pretty much giving all of them uh, to the uh, pure warrior. Unless we kill a lot of monsters in the dark world, uh, Hagre, and he gains some yeah, Hagre, mammoth yeah. gains. Yeah, it's almost certainly going to be stunted. Sixty six. My hero has more HP than my. It's not a good sign. Um. Yeah. So uh, one thing to to talk about, oh. we we keep talking about the warrior's HP and oh, Salamander wow! I didn't know. know. I had no idea salamanders could appear here. Um, salamanders uh, are interesting in the dark world. Uh, they like to go to sleep, but they also are one of the rare. Uh, random encounters that have the same intense breath attack that Baramos has. Fortunately, they don't have a whole lot of hit points, and they give 2,000 experience points each, which is actually really, really nice. Yeah, that's why I was actually happy to see that guy 15, you know, 1,500 for killing that guy on my warrior. Like, He needs that. He's he's going to be dying for XP. Speaking of mammoth gains, he got 20 there, so yeah. that's really good to see. Double-digit stamina. Eat it. Okay, so the Dark World is going to be uh, pretty complex. There's going to be lots of different enemies and lots of different ways in which I can handle these encounters. And true separation, I think, from a good player to a great player at this endgame section really is mastering all of the different counters. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of potential encounter formations, so you don't really memorize all of them. It's more like enemies appear in able to evaluate the situation, make some decisions, and then from there. Obviously, there are a lot of common formations that you should just know what to do. Those, uh, Kragon, not, not Kragons, the, uh, the King Dragon Tortagon things, uh, that we saw just a moment ago, um, are fairly resistant to magic, have fairly high defense, they're just really annoying to fight. Um, yeah. they also are not particularly dangerous, uh, as enemies go in the dark world, so that's why Dieter just chose to run. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there are so many. I mean, so um, one game that unfortunately I don't think is featured in this marathon, but was featured last week at Retrothon, is Dragon Quest II on the Super Famicom. That entire run is just encounter handling, constantly evaluating how you're handling encounters and make sure you get that experience as you go. And this Dark World section of Dragon Quest Three is similar. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of high experience value monsters here, and we're just going to be getting a lot of random encounters as we make our way through, picking up items we need to get the King Sword, picking up quest items we need to get the Soma's Castle. Um, we do want to maximize that experience gain while also going fast at the same time. Yeah, that's what our first few pickups have been here in the Dark World. I already cast that. That's all right. Um, we stopped by Radatom Castle and got our first of three quest items that we need to form. The final uh, item that we need to get to this castle, the Rainbow Drop. So we got the Stones of Sunlight from Radatom Castle, hidden in a slightly different location, but close enough. Um, and we're going to need the Staff of Rain and the... Uh, it's not called... Roto's Talisman. It's not called Erdrick's Talisman yet. It's still just the Sacred Talisman. And we'll find out why later. Um, but there's also a couple of other things that we're going to take care of too. We went to um, that town, Domdora, and picked up the Orakal. The Orakalkan. That's a precious metal that we need to forge the King's Sword, which is the most powerful weapon we're going to get our hands on on Triple Run Fight. This is a fun little encounter. Um, these uh, mud hands uh, like to call for help, and if there is room on the screen, they will call Granite Titans. Uh, Granite Titans can be kind of nasty. 
Um, they are susceptible to sleep. We will be uh, fighting some forced encounters with Granite Titans later. But if you're not forced to fight them, you don't want to fight them at all. Um, you see, I talked about, you know, about three hours ago, I was talking about paying attention to the animations that enemies do can tell you what it is that they're trying to do. Anytime that you see a Granite Titan stomp its foot on the ground, it's trying to crit. And if it crits, there is a non-zero chance that someone's just going to get squashed into paste. Yeah, uh, so you I really don't want to see those if you I can HP help it. soldiers can probably withstand some of the more powerful blows like that, but it's not a good time. It's not something you want to see. Hey, it's Horks. This is a really slow encounter to deal with. Expel works reasonably well, but if I expel these ghouls, the mud hands will simply just call more powerful enemies in the and that's not gonna happen. So I'm just gonna opt to run that fight. Okay, this is the town of Myra, or Cole as it's known in the original Dragon War series. Uh, we're going to sell some items here. We're going to get a ton of money. We took some cursed items out of that Rocky Mountain cave. None of this stuff is required, and we're not going to use any of it. It's just worth a lot. Of it. And we're going to rapidly get up to about 70,000 gold. We need 69,000 to buy the, the things that I want. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of shopping here. Uh, this is going to be the last bit of shopping that we do um, there are, in order uh, to prepare for Zoma. Uh -huh. Four items I'm going to purchase here. So we're going to get Sage's Staff. This casts a free heal more when used as an item in battle. Sage is going to hang out of this. This is a water flying clothes. It's got good resistance and defense power. We'll give to the Sage. And this is another suit of blade armor we'll give to our other warrior. So now both warriors have uh, blade armor. Need to search this spot and get this item, the fairy flute. Good on statues. Slightly different functionality, but uh, it, it, it's a hundred percent. It never, important. it never occurred to me that it both wakes up Rubus and puts the golem to sleep. I just realized that's kind of funny. All right, let's input there. But yeah, we want this thing. It's the king's sword. We're gonna equip this on the hero and uh, make some inventory adjustments here. We're gonna give his old sword to. Mage Ward, Thunder Sword, she's going to get the Sanagi Sword, goes to Sage. She's going to grab this extra prayer ring as well. From this point on, the hero's MP is kind of not real. The Mage in the front is going to need some MP, but the Sage in the back is going to be draining a lot of MP all the time, or at least this part of the, part of the game. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the mysterious hat that you get to lean on uh, in Dragon Quest Two is not present here. Would be awfully nice if it was. Yeah, that Dragon Warrior or to recover by walking. That's where it's at. Which is an awfully ironic statement coming from me as someone who never incorporates the Hat of Happiness into his route. Man. Um, Rubus Tower here is a place where we're probably not going to be taking a lot of random encounters. That is to say, we're going to be running from the ones that we do see. Um, there is one exception. Um, it is possible, though very rare, to see a metal babble here. Um, although I, all the formations I've seen metal babbles in on the top floor also tend to come with uh, magic wyverns, which can be uh, pretty annoying. Um, so it's not the ideal place to see one if you do see one. There is a six times metal babble formation up there. Oh, uh, that one I don't think I've seen before. You've seen um, it once. <laughs> um, I know it's yeah, up there. Um, the, the, but there is a small chance we could see a metal babble here, which would be nice. Um, if we're going to see metal babbles at all for the rest, there is also a small chance we could have seen a metal babble in the Necrogon. That one's super duper rare. Yeah, um, but uh, if we're going to see a metal babble, it's likely going to be after we get off the boat and start walking towards Rimmeldar. And that also, Dina briefly mentioned it before, um, one of the placeholder items that we threw in the Sage's inventory to get her item configuration the way that we want it is more of that poison moth powder that we saw uh, during the metal slime grind. Um, when metal babbles appear in the Rimmeldar area, they tend to appear with Darth Bears, and Darth Bears are susceptible to confusion, and they can try to kill the metal babbles oh. for you. Oh, wow, that's a nasty fight. It's just so slow, those dragons are really just hard to deal with, and see them burn, it's just gonna make it even more. 
interesting. So, no, I'll take that first yeah. link. Sure, thanks. Okay, I one also... thing. Sorry, uh, one thing I don't want to forget here is that I've been keeping this in the back of my mind. Even though the warrior was dead during Baramos, I still did end up using the start of the fight on the tour. So I don't actually have one in my inventory, and now is the perfect time to leave the tower and go get one. Yeah, you can opt to uh, get one. If you do use your leaf during Baramos, you can also opt to get one after um, getting the Stones of Sunlight. Um, it's one of those things where you're going to be casting the return spell anyway, um, so you might as well go... Uh, whatever you were going to return to a different place, you can just return to Dharma. Uh, yeah, and then, it was... Uh, routed in that way. It was something that... Um, I think I was having a discussion one time with Clear Tonic about. It's basically like... I'm giving myself more opportunities to die, basically. If I died in Rubus's tower, I could uh, have simply come up here and revived using World. So I'm like there's... giving myself the like one more opportunity to like for something to go, basically. And then you also, uh, if you if you wait till now to pick one up, you absolutely wanted to get it now because. Uh the sailing we're about to do we're about to spend quite a bit of time in the ocean and so this is going this is the time where we are going to potentially see one of the single most dangerous encounters in the game um Kragons or K king dragon or whatever their japanese name is um basically if we see any orange octopuses on the screen um there are ways that we can we have a way of handling the fight but if you don't know what you're doing um it's easy to get multiple people killed uh because uh, Kragons can attack up to three times and they can crit. Uh, and even if they don't crit, they do a ton of damage. Yeah, their attack power is still pretty hefty about it. Can we get the sail all the way here? Oh my goodness. That's a long trip without a fight. That is an insanely long trip without a fight. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to pop into the shrine here. This shrine, um, if you're paying attention, you may note that the shrine is exactly in the spot where you pick up Erdrich's token in Dragon Quest One. Um, here there's a shrine with an elf queen who, for whatever reason, knows when your birthday is, uh, and, uh, realizes that you are, in fact, the hero spoken of in Legend, and just kind of hands over the Staff of Rain. Yep, and that's what we use the fairy flute for at the top of Rubens' tower, by helping that statue of Rubens. She gives us the sacred talisman. So we've come here with the staff, the stones, and the talisman gotten. What's it look like? It's the rainbow drop. Rainbow drop to create the rainbow bridge that will take us to the final dungeon of the game. This is the last key item that we still going to collect some cool, exciting stuff in Zoma's castle, but uh, this is the last thing we need to get there. So from here on out, it's basically the point of no return. Um, for various reasons, dying and have to come back to Zoma's castle is going to represent a very significant time loss. Especially as we get further and further to the castle, wiping out is going to be very painful. Um, so, Agachan is it? I'm desperate for XP though, so I am going to kill these guys. And this is another example of uh, where subtle um, decision making can uh, just speed things up so much. Uh, you saw the uh, Blazemore spell targeted at that mud hand there. Uh, we know that uh, Blazemore is going to kill that mud hand in one shot, and so that's going to prevent us from seeing any of those nasty granite titans. Did I just see 15 HP on that warrior? Or is that the mage warrior? Um, uh, they just didn't see to... me. It's fine. I'm still going to take the fight. Normally this is a situation where I'd be running away from monsters that don't see me, but... And I'm dying for XP, at least yeah, on the warrior. The pure warrior, this is all to make up for the pure warrior being uh, dead for the Baramos fight. I mean, this does not make up for it, but it uh, but it helps. Uh, we've, Yeah, so the warrior did level up on that last fight, so we've gotten about 35 HP over where we were at, so that's nice. Uh, but this warrior is still not where we want him to be at all, unfortunately. Yeah, he's still uh, quite a few thousand xp compared to this is one of the most vile fights oh boy uh right guy thanks for the raid man appreciate it uh welcome in everybody to a uh, different version of dragon warrior 3 this is the super famicom version um yeah this fight is uh 
uh, absolutely disgusting. Uh, these mud hands, again, as we've seen, can call granite titans for help. Uh, and these salamanders, as we saw also, uh, they have, uh, I believe they are the only random encounter in the game that has the intense flames breath that uh, Baramos uses. And so as you can see, we are taking an absolute ton of damage here. Um, the combination of Firebane and uh, Boom out of the Thunder Sword will take care of the Mud Hands. And then uh, that kind of tornado animation you see here, you saw there was the Infermost spell. I want to say it's Kasroosh in the uh, newer translations. Anyway, the when you fling the King Sword in combat, it casts the Infermost spell and is incredibly useful in situations like this. Just another one of the things you miss when you do King Sword cut. Eight! Oh, yeah, the, the was warrior was one. doing so well. He got six stamina, so that's hopeful. But eight was a low HP roll. Let's see my sages out of him. That's okay. Got these prayer rings. I have currently three in my inventory. Two are in the sages bag, and one is in the bag. Those are the rolls, but it. Hey, maybe we'll get a sage by kill because you got the experience funneling from Baramos. That's true. Bashi Could also, something. yeah, I could see Bashi Rura before the, uh, although even if you see Bashi Rura before Daimajin, you would still want to fight them for the experience. Again, a fight that lately I've been tempted to just simply run away from. But. We, uh, yeah, we want to, all fights in the Dark World are worth tons of experience, and so again, the situation being what it is, we just want to take as much as we can. Plus, moving statues are not the same as the Granite Titans, those are gray, the Granite yeah, Titans those are, are green. The, those are the weak stone, man. So we just, uh, we just put him to sleep and throw out a buy kill on the hero and just Yeah, that's uh, just going to make things a little efficient in terms of reducing them to pebbles. Okay, what are so here we are, uh, Zoma's Castle, uh, final dungeon of the game. Ideally, we will just uh, clear this in one shot, map things there, up. There are some pretty powerful uh, monsters. Uh, in addition to the salamanders, which you might see in, in groups, uh, the other two enemies we really are on the lookout for are the uh, Balrogs and the Archmages. Which can appear together for an extra fun encounter. Um, Balrogs uh, can cast uh, the defeat spell. Uh, I cannot. Uh, Thwack, I believe, is the modern translation. And uh, Zadaki is the Japanese name. Um, so that's uh, a chance of instant death uh, targeted at the entire party. Um, fortunately, uh, with our Sage holding on to the Mist Staff and being fairly fast, uh, they're fairly susceptible to stop spells, so ideally we just don't see that at all. Um, but it is one thing to think about here. Um, we're in a series of four fights against Granite Titans. Um, these fights pretty much run on a script uh, where we've got those two sleep stabs in our inventory. Um, it's actually really interesting how uh, the inventory management shakes things out. Uh, the Sage and the Pure Warrior are going to use the Sleep Stabs. The Sage ideally puts them to sleep at the start of the fight. Um, the Pure Warrior, the Mage Warrior, is going to be by killing the hero, who's going to be doing the bulk of our damage. And then if any of them wake up or fail to go to sleep, the Pure Warrior going last will ideally put them to sleep, which then just sets us up to just hold X and clear the fight. Um, optionally, you can have the Sage use the Sage's Staff to top up anyone's HP. Uh, and if they, if everyone's HP is topped off, you can have her uh, use the Prayer Ring as well. Hey, Bashirura! Might be useful later. Yeah, there's one encounter in particular I can think of where it's very powerful. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, the one encounter we will not be taking for experience. Oh, boy. Uh, right. So, we could opt, if, if we were just trying to go as fast as possible, we could opt to use Bashirura here. I, I don't know if Limbo is 100%. It's not. It's the same on rate Granite Titans. Okay. Uh, it is kind of funny, though. Uh, the first time I got Bashirura, I opted to use it, and the animation that you see is... Uh, and the accompanying kind of... <laughs> sound effect, the falling off the br <laughs> like bridge noise. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's hilarious. It's instant classic, but... <laughs> 
swag tiles. No, thanks. No, no swag tiles. Today. Lazy tiles. Yeah, we're gonna do lazy tiles. So that that those uh, diamond tiles, if you're not familiar, um, they uh, mess up your controls. Uh, they kind of uh, they tilt your D-pad basically controls. 90 degrees yeah. either left or right. The bright part of the diamond corresponds to up on the D-pad. So there's actually a spot you can stand and just hold up and just walk all the way through it. Yeah. There's, so there, there's what we call the lazy way, and then there is a path through that is actually, I want to say, one or two seconds faster, but requires a decidedly more complex series of inputs. And so... Uh, Darko and famously Hactical are the only people I know who have actually 25, found that. 25, that's more like it. Yeah, nice. And 11 stamina. Yeah, too. double digit stamina. That's what we're looking See more. Two or three we've... more of those and right back into it. Uh -huh. I want to say I've seen about 70 HP on this pure warrior, so he's doing his best. He's trying, man. He's trying real hard. Oh, drop that tip. Just as I was trying to open it. So you can see, I do occasionally still this time to time. Oh, hey, who's this? All right. So uh, there's some warrior here fighting uh, King Dragon. And we yeah. do see here, it is, in fact, our father, Ortega. Yes, if you can't read the kana here, it says, Ortega. This is Ortega, our father. Presumed dead on his quest to defeat Baramos, he fell into the Dark World and lost his memory. It still is fighting the forces of evil. Uh, if you're not this... familiar with what's about to happen and cannot tell from the uh, somber music, things are not going to go perfectly for Mr. Ortega. The uh, NES version of this fight is subject to some RNG. Um, unfortunately, there is no scenario in which Ortega can win. This version, however, is entirely scripted. Uh, yep. Ortega and King Dragon do the exact same thing every time. It's basically a cutscene, and it's also kind of a funny meme uh, because we've seen Ortega cast the Raiden spell, uh, I believe, twice and unfortunately ran out of MP. He was trying to heal all himself, but he was out of MP, and so will fall to King Dragon. Yes, unfortunately. Ortega. It's also made it's made all the more somber by the fact that he says he can't see or hear. He just kind of senses the presence of somebody there. Uh, and uh, then, doesn't realize uh, it's his own child. Yeah. Yeah. He says, uh, I've got a son back in Eliahan. Please tell him I love him or some such. And then just dies. Well, Expel is not working so well on this guy, so I'm just going to have to slash him up. Yeah, these Swordoids can be really annoying. They're really, really, really fast. Uh, the Sage is the only character that's going to outspeed them, and even she doesn't do it every single time. Um, Nifidem, or the Expel spell, can work against them. The really dangerous thing about them, though, is... Uh, they go twice, and they can crit, and mm -hmm. so it's one of the last enemies that... I mean, if they all get expelled, then great. If they don't get expelled and they crit you, uh, then it's not so great. Yeah. Um, but uh, here, uh, the last few items we're going to pick up before the boss rush. These dragon zombies are also just really annoying. This is They're like the best encounter to get dangerous. if you're in a hurry. This is the best yeah. fight to see. You just bounce them and they're slow. Uh, they tend to not really do a whole lot. So I'll go ahead and just destroy that one since it's in the way, but that might be the last random encounter we see for the game. Hint, hint. Um, yeah, but those boxes there, um, we picked up a second world tree leaf. You are allowed to get the one in the chest and have the one that you picked up on the overworld. This is the only time that you can have two world tree leaves in your inventory. Um, we also picked up an extra prayer ring and we picked up the sage's stone. Um, he's... Uh, it's second maybe only to the ball of light in terms of being the most important item in this game um, and we will be shuffling it around a little bit here we're going to put it on the sage for the king dragon fight as we go in to start this boss rush um, but then it's going to go to the pure warrior and it's going to stay on the pure warrior for the rest of the game 
Uh, and it's the reason why the Pure Warriors HP is so important, because especially for the Zoma fight and the Baramos Bomas fight in particular, the only thing the Pure Warrior is going to ever do is use that Sage of Stone. The Pure Warrior will never be defending, and so the Pure Warrior is uh, exposed to just being completely brutalized uh, by these bosses. Uh, and so here, starting the boss rush with King Dragon, or King Hydra, rather. Um, we're gonna go ahead and open up with a uh, buy kill. Uh, we're gonna, we, we do try to sleep. Uh, we do try to put King Hydra to sleep. There is a small chance of that happening. Um, didn't happen here, unfortunately. Oh, good. Uh, that's really uh, helpful because I'm a sap on first turn, so this is gonna give me another opportunity to try it. Good, got it. Excellent. So we did actually get to sleep on turn two, and we got the sap off as well. And so now, uh, with the setup being what it is, uh, we just pretty much hold X and have everybody attack. Um, the sage will be spamming that sage's stone, and ideally, what's going to happen here, because of the fact that the sage goes first, uh, we can heal up to full and then kill King Hydra in that same turn, uh, which will save us having to heal after the fight is over. Yeah, I'm a little bit, a little bit off because Sap missed that first turn. My damage output was a little bit lower than usual, but overall just fine. Okay, first one down. There are three mini. Did want to do? There are three mini, mini bosses I have to defeat for um, Zoma himself. This second one, uh, Bomus. This is the most horrifying one. Trio. Yeah, the other it's two by far... are pretty stable. This guy can be can be a boss. Um, Bomus uh, is incredibly volatile. Uh, Bomus can take up to three actions per turn. Oh, shoot. I was wondering about I that. I mismenued some stuff. This is okay. I've done this before. On I have also, I, yeah, I've also done this before. So uh, what we meant to do is switch the Sage's Staff and the Sage's Stone so that the Pure Warrior would have the Sage's Staff and the Sage would have the Sage's Stone. Um, but unfortunately, that got missed in the menuing to prepare for this fight. Um, it can, If Bomus is kind, this shouldn't matter. Um, if Bomus is rude... Uh, we could end up getting bounced on out of here, but Dino's going to do his best. Um, so Baramus Bonus here can take up the three actions per turn and can physically attack, can cast Explode It, which is what he's doing here, or he can breathe. Now, taking one turn, uh, one action in that first round is really, really, really good for us. Um, I didn't see whether or not Sap hit. Didn't. That's why I'm like trying to figure out how I'm going to cast it. So we did get sap uh, this time around. Um, unfortunately, we are getting a lot of exploded here. Um, but uh, for the most part, this is looking about as stable as you could ask for, uh, for the situation that we are in. <laughs> My warrior went faster than Bomas the one time it does not absolutely like, matter. Wow, that, okay. That's, that's, that's hilarious. This game sometimes, man. Uh, so yeah. Uh, from this point, um, normally you would just be having the hero attack to deal the most damage. Um, Bomus does not have very much HP, and uh, with uh, the hero by killed and Bomus sapped, uh, we should be clearing this either this round or next. Um, there is also, of course, the blade armor reflect damage to contend with. Okay, we I, should clear the fight. I can't believe how cooperative he was. Yeah, he was no. like, all right, all right, I'll spare you. This is, yeah, this this fight again. So you're seeing here Bomus is casting. He's going to end with the triple yeah. just to let you know <laughs> what he can do. This but... is what Bomus can do. This is what he can do. That is the nastiest thing he can do is cast Exploded three times in a row. But fortunately, it was his dying breath that he did it with. Uh, right, so we're gonna go that ahead immediately. And, yeah, I forget because yeah. the orb of light isn't even. So, whoopsie. Okay, that's all better. All right, so now we've got the inventory management all sussed out. We're gonna go ahead and heal up our party members and uh, move on to Baramos Gonus. Uh, if you didn't have enough Baramos yet in your speed run, well, guess what? There's one more waiting for you. Um, Gonus, uh, is, Baramos Gonus is an interesting fight, or Baramos Zombie, as you call it. Yeah, Zombie Baramos. 
Um, this is an interesting fight. Um, Baramos Zombie has zero speed and thus zero defense, so it's the only boss we're never going to cast Sap on because it doesn't do anything. Um, Baramos Zombie also does one thing. He physically attacks, and he physically attacks really, really hard. He can do it once or twice. So we're going to spend the first couple of rounds here having uh, casting increase with our Mage Warrior and our Sage, and having everybody else defend. And once we get our defense uh, up to the maximum, uh, then we're going to switch over to have to by killing, getting our um, attack damage up, uh, and uh, doing a we can do a little bit of spot healing uh, with the pure warriors uh, sage's stone as well as the sage's sage's staff. Uh, but for the most part, uh, once we're at this point in the setup. Uh, it's pretty much just full decks and win. Yep. Um, Zombie does have a lot of HP, uh, but uh, yeah, once you're at this point in the setup, it's a pretty trivial fight. Yeah, from this point, we're gonna just keep bashing him until he uh, decides he's had enough. I'm just gonna be careful about my HP, try to keep myself topped off. It's gonna help save me a little bit of MP when the fight is over as well, if I can keep it in motion. Yeah. Um, from here, once this fight is clear, Dieter's going to be doing um, a little bit of menuing. Um, you're going to see him use all those uh, life force nuts we've picked up oh, on the on. warrior. Um, oh, nice self kill. Um, so I'm going to explain really quick. Uh, we keep talking about these life force nuts, and we keep talking about how low the pure warrior's health is. So why did we use the life force nuts before now? Well, the reason is uh, if you use the life force nuts before this point in the run, we are not going to be getting any more experience points. We're going to be fighting Zoma and finishing up the game. Um, if we had used the Life Force Nuts on the Warrior before this point, they would have basically been at a complete loss. 304 is actually pretty decent. Yeah, I was going to say. The situation that we were, that we were looking at That's not at bad before. at all. I'm fine with that. Um, so, uh, so we save the life force nuts for the very end because if you if you use them uh before if you use them while the warrior is going to keep gaining levels again it's it's basically wait it's basically a waste because the game is going to look at the warrior's hp and he's not going to gain as much the level after you use the life force nuts so we basically wait until the very end of the speed run to give them all to the pure warrior because again during the Zoma fight, the pure warrior is going to do one thing and one thing only, and he's going to be spamming that Sage's Stone. All right, here we go. Um, it's time for the final battle. Yep. So it's time for the Zoma fight. There is... Uh, I love the way this fight works out. Every character has a unique role, um, and uh, you're, the way you're going to act during this fight is going to depend on what happened the run before and the status of your characters. However... This first round of combat is uh, locked in. Um, Zoma will always do his Icy Breath and uh, Snowstorm as a follow-up. The only thing that can change is that every once in a while, your Sage will outspeed Zoma, which you love to see because then Zoma just doesn't do anything. Um, but from here on out, um, the vast majority of your actions are actually going to be the same. So at the start of this, this uh, fight, um, with uh, Zoma doing his freezing waves to uh, remove our buffs. Um, we're going to buy kill the hero. We're going to swing with the... We're going to... Okay, sorry. The Mage Warrior is going to buy kill the hero. The Pure Warrior is going to use the uh, Sage's, sta Sage's Stone. And the, the hero is going to attack, and the Sage is going to use the Sage's Staff to heal anybody who needs it. Um, anytime you see uh, those uh, waves of light, uh, that means our buy kill has been removed and we need to use it again. Uh, and Diener may opt to play a little bit safe and cast uh, Increase as well uh, after we see those icy waves. Um, but for the most part, the thing, the, the really important thing here is to make sure that our hero uh, is always under the influence of Baika so that uh, he can do as much damage as possible. Oh boy, ooh! Uh, so Good we're damage. seeing, we got, we got a nice critical hit out of the Genie Axe from the Mage Warrior. Um, and uh, we're getting some nice damage in here. Uh, again, we're looking at that reflect damage here coming off of that blade armor. Um, we yeah, have the... Up. Yeah, it's going to add up real quick. We like to have the pure warrior... Or sorry, the mage warrior up in that first slot defend if uh, we don't need to cast by kill um, because she is the most likely to be hit by a physical attack if a physical attack is coming. 
Um, Any time that the pure warrior in the second slot is mis is missing any amount of HP, we're gonna have the sage uh, restore that with the uh, sage's staff. Um, there is an item sitting in the sage's inventory that might get equipped if we're in a good uh, position to do so. Uh, but for the most part, we're gonna be playing this uh, yeah, pretty I'm straight gonna, up. I'm gonna mohawk wait here. Okay. So what Dean is doing here is uh, going into the inventory and equipping an item that we bought a long time ago called the Mohawk Hat. And the reason why we equip that is because normally the Sage has the Meteorite Armband, which is going to double her agility and make her likely to go first. But because we just cast Sap here, we actually want the Sage to go after Zoma. And the reason is because this, these icy waves, actually removes Zoma's sap. I believe Zoma in Dragon Quest 3 is the only boss in the entire Dragon Quest series that can remove sap from himself. And so because he can do that, um, one of the optional things that you can do is pick up that Mohawk hat and put it on the Sage so that uh, in case he does do a Freezing Waves attack, the Sage will go second and get that sap off and you can still get a little bit of extra damage in that same round. The important thing to know in this fight is that Zoma has 4,700 HP and does not recover under any circumstances. So this yes. is a battle of attrition. As long as I'm alive and fighting, I'm winning. Yes. Uh, I my um, If the hero dies and you don't have leaves, that's a pretty um, unfortunate spot to be in. However, my PB actually has a dead hero, and Zoma was killed with bl with uh, Blazemore from the Mage Warrior. So yes, as long as somebody is standing, you always have a chance to win. Because um, again, so the, the blade armor damage that we're seeing reflected back at Zoma is going to add up. Every single hit that we get out of the Mage Warrior or the hero is going to add up. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a battle of attrition. Um, we're also, of course... Um, paying attention to what Zoma does. Um, the freezing wave spam can be annoying, but it also does mean he's not doing any damage to us, which in certain situations is the more ideal thing to see. Um, this icy breath attack is the thing that we don't want to see, um, and unfortunately occasionally you can do it twice. Um, the, well, I'll talk a little bit about what Zoma can actually do. Um, nice out of his, Oh yeah, very nice dodge. Um, out of his, he has eight actions he can take. Three of those actions are uh, physical attacks. Uh, two of them are uh, his icy breath. Uh, two are his uh, his uh, uh, freezing waves, and then the other two are macchiato or snowstorm. Macchiato is actually the least powerful thing he can do, and the thing that we like to see him do the most. Unfortunately, it's the only thing that he can't do twice in a single round. Everything else, the freezing waves, physical attacks, the icy breath, um, he can potentially do that twice in a single turn. Um, but anytime you see him... Uh, anytime you see him rearing his head back and uh, you see some ice crystals on the screen, uh, that means he's doing a uh, snowstorm, and that means we're pretty guaranteed to be uh, pretty safe that round and uh, have a pretty nice setup going into the round after that. Um, but yeah, I've always found this fight to be really interesting because it's it's a it's a fight where you've got a, a dedicated buffer, a dedicated healer, a dedicated damage output, and then your sage is just kind of what your sage is going to do at any given point. She's got so many different options uh, for things that she can do. Again, we're going here. Or we're going to the Mohawk hat. We're going to cast it out. We're going to try to we're going to try to maximize the damage that we can get. So here. We're in a, a good position damage-wise, where the hero is going to hit really, really, really hard. Now, it is unfortunate that we took those two Ice Breath attacks, um, but we're going to go okay. ahead. We're going to go ahead and top things I off love it. here. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, so Freezing Waves into Mahiado uh, is perfect uh, for this uh, point in the fight. Just gonna and, let me stabilize uh, here. I don't have my normal uh, splits on, so I don't know long, how long I've been fighting. And, oh, well, that was a, that's something. That's something that can happen. You go from 100% health to dead. You get double punched. Yeah, the hero getting punched twice. Uh, it's okay. Very, very low odds of that happening. Um, but fortunately, we still have uh, Leaf of the World Tree. I assume your other one is on the hero. Yes. 
Okay. So we usually start this fight with a leaf on the mage warrior and a leaf on the hero. Um, you can optionally choose to put uh, a leaf on the sage, um, but the hero and the mage warrior are going to be your safest options here. You want to put them there specifically for in case in the terrible event that the pure warrior dies, um, you need to bring him back immediately, or as you can see, the damage output is going to whittle your party to nothing very, 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 very quickly. I think we're almost done. Yeah, we we've been we've been doing a lot of good damage here. Hero's got some good uh, hits with sap and bike kill still on. We've seen a lot of blade armor damage coming out of this fight. Um, and as Diener said, this really is just a war of attrition. And hey, wow, got him. Good call, Diener. Good lord. Four hours, three minutes, just just barely. Uh, didn't make that four hour mark, but yeah. uh, not not too bad, not too bad considering <laughs> what happened. Yeah, that Only, was uh, uh, that was a good run. That was an exciting one. We got to see the um, the, uh, the hero have a horrible nightmare of him dying to Paramos, and he woke up a few <laughs> hours earlier and was like, "Wait, <laughs> wait, that didn't really happen." And uh, yeah, one important thing to note here is that uh, because we're playing this game in Japanese, we're following Japanese um, uh, speedrun timing, uh, which means we start the timer as soon as we turn the console on, and we stop the timer when the end pops up on the screen. And the end pops up exactly seven minutes after you kill Zoma. Um, so we got to make our way back to Ratatom Castle and talk to the king, and then we get to watch the ending, and... Diener may or may not sing. I won't uh, put him on the spot. He can choose whether or not he wants to. But it is yeah. traditional to st it's traditional to uh, sing during the credits. There are I I the was song. planning to. I'm also like a solid half an hour behind schedule. So like I I know that like we're not in any hurry or that. But well, if you wanted to cut me off, you could totally cut me off. But <laughs> I don't think we're in that kind of hurry. So plan to uh, do everything the normal way. So, yeah, that'll be it. We'll uh, do the last cutscene here, which is just to go back to uh, Radha's home. The king here will uh, celebrate my heroics and bestow upon me a special title of the greatest hero of the land, Roto Erdrick, and original Dragon Warrior series. As if you've been paying close attention, Dragon Quest 3 is a prequel to Dragon Quest 1. Legend of Erdrick was begun here. Yep, and this time for real, uh, we get to talk to the king, and uh, the trumpeters are going to play a little tune. One thing of note, um, We've talked about some of the, the sad story elements in this game. The, the one thing that I find um, to be a bit poignant is the fact that as soon as you step out of that cave, um, that text box that pops up says you hear the sound of something closing. And that hole that we dropped to drop through to get to the dark world actually closes up, which we, and you go to your return, sp your, your return spell menu, and all of the overworld towns are gone. You can only return to locations here in the dark world. <laughs> Uh, which means your mom never sees you again. Yes, uh, you the just, hero, uh... the hero Roto stays in Alifgard and leaves behind his weapons and armor for the future heroes, but is yep. never seen again. Hero left on his uh, 16th birthday and never came back. That's basically what's summarizing here. So yeah, that's it. I hope you all enjoyed Dragon Quest III Super Famicom version. Alavkian, thanks so much for hanging out with me. Oh, I, I appreciate it. I absolutely adore this speedrun. It's this been a is... while since I put any serious time into it, but it is an amazing speedrun. You never see the same thing twice. It's always a fresh mm -hmm. experience. Yep. Just I, a ton of fun. I really like this run, and I hope you guys have had fun watching it. Soshite Densetsu ga hajimata. And thus the legend was born.
This is also the point in uh, any time you finish a run, especially if it's a PB. Um, the nice thing about watching the ending is you have time to just kind of go through and talk about your splits. もやしてもう一度戦うと誓うどこかできっと誰かが愛の言葉を待ってる何もいらない強くなりたい光り輝く大地を優しして青空に耳を澄ませ振り向くな鬼色と夢に見た微笑みよ Hi. Hi. Domo Domo. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed a little bit of that. Hope you enjoyed a little bit of a Soste Den Setsue there. And uh, that's pretty much it. Um, it's about two minutes left until uh, time. Yep, yep. So the timer, the official timer, will be coming up just in a moment. One last time, thanks everybody for tuning in to Dragon Quest RTA Marathon 2023. And don't go anywhere, because the next run is coming up. My good friend Shiner CCC is going to be playing one of my favorite runs, Dragon Warrior 4. Series continues. Dragon Warrior 4. Next. Yeah, the Dragon Warrior 4 speed run is an absolute treat. It's one of my favorites behind Dragon Quest 3, so definitely, definitely stick mm -hmm. around for that run. It's it's a beast of a of a run, and it's also got like a bunch of different like chapters that have you get a lot of different flavor throughout the whole whole run. So, all right, we're here at the end. This is end of the credits and the final time. on wait for it okay now all right i to continue to dragon quest one and two i've got about 403 flat on my timer that i've been keeping, so yeah 403 flats what i see as well four hours so. and three minutes so hey <laughs> this is one of the, this is perhaps the worst run i've time-wise that i finished in probably Years. more than a year probably more than yeah. a year um but there's a very nice explanation for that i forgot one tiny little detail. it turns out to have cost me about oh well oh we got, well we got to enjoy a little bit of the uh the second half which is the more exciting part of the run frankly if i'm saying say so um and uh yeah cool that's gonna that's gonna do it for dragon quest 3 Famicom, so uh i think i are gonna so uh anything else you have to say um no not really uh again thanks for letting me hop in here and talk about a game that i absolutely love talking about um again this game being in japanese uh, it's always nice to have extra commentary here for people who can't read it so that they can understand what's going on um but uh yeah thanks again for having me and uh good luck to everyone else in subsequent runs Thanks so much, and uh, don't go anywhere. More Dragon Quest RTA is coming right up.